all this money sloshing around, these incredibly low interest rates, I think we risk an inflation surge. If the economy stays as strong as it is, fueled by all of the stimulus that was put behind it, you get inflation. The Fed is likely to start to shift their, their policy stance in the coming months. We've never had a situation historically where the Fed has not begun to normalize rates and there's an inflation concern in the markets. No one knows if these inflation pressures are going to prove more transitory or, or less transitory. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on Bloomberg Television. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up a quarter of 1%. We advance nine points on the S&P 500. Call it 10. Tom, another week of inflation obsessions. And yet this week, 10-year break-evens <clears throat> are having their biggest weekly decline. Yeah. Going back to September of 2020. You don't hear much about it. You don't hear much about it. I think it's dead on, John. The economic research notes this weekend as we go into Monday are going to be really extraordinary. To me, the operative economic word, and John, this is ju this is jargon, it's a pro word, is it's been a nudgy week. A nudgy it's been week. an incredibly nudgy, goofy week. I want to focus on one thing, John, and I love what you said about real yields. As you go to the real yield, look for that, folks, an expanded edition this afternoon, 90 Minutes. John, I'm going to look at the wall of cash out there in the action of the NASDAQ in the last few. Nice promotion there. Thank you. On radio, <laughs> we're promoting the real yield today at 1 p.m. John, the NASDAQ's a moonshot, up 4% off the mat two days ago. Inflation expectations come in a little bit. Tech rebounding just a little bit. We spent a lot of time talking about peak growth expectations. <clears throat> we started the conversation earlier this week by discussing that maybe have we seen peak inflation expectations how will we guide our way through that debate in the coming weeks and months to me it's open and you know we can go on with that today and you know i'm sure we will as well but john the the one i think you had the number 280 gazillion dollars to me it's the pendulum of ginormous cash that's out there i'm not suggesting it's going to go into speculative assets because so much of it is a deadweight conservative idea but i think the theme into june is this ginormous cash that's there so ginormous john is cfa level Thank you, TK, Thank alongside you. with Nudgy, <laughs> CFA <laughs> level four as well. Cash on a sideline, almost cliche, Lisa, but <clears throat> wow. There's a lot of cash on the sidelines. And part of the uncertainty here lies in who has that cash. Is it the lower income workers who've gotten checks from the government who are putting it in their savings and are more likely to spend it? Or is it the wealthiest individuals who haven't gone on vacations who are less likely to set spend it because it's going into their wealth buckets? And this, I think, is one of the biggest disparities among economists <clears throat> with both the highest and the lowest GDP estimates this year. They are going on vacations. Have you tried to book a vacation yes. in this country? Yes. John. They are going on vacations. They are. Yeah. But how many vacations can you take to make up for last year? Quite I'm a trying. lot. We're, okay. we're going to test it. <laughs> I'm trying. We're gonna, we're, I, I've hardly been off this year myself. Can you, can yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Can I get the orange juice? With Aren't the you off on it? Monday Thank again? You. Haven't you got another day off coming I, I was scheduled, but I had to take that back because Afterthought's going to camp. She's going to Camp Gulfstream. It's up in Labrador, just below the Arctic Circle. Why were you jet shopping day? for me yesterday, Tom? Really? <clears throat> well, this is the prosperity that's out there and the consumption that's out there. You, know, you talk about it, and I'm sorry. Seriously, Lisa, this is a linkage of the goods-producing sector, like the airplanes to get you up to the lodge, into the success of the service sector, like what we do. And, John, that recovery is evident. Yeah, I'm just going to turn to the price action. I'm not getting into your shop in a private jet. Second so futures <laughs> up nine on the S&P this Friday morning. Good morning to you all. We advanced two-tenths of 1%. In the bond market, yields just a little bit higher on the day. 163.52 is where we are right now on 10. So the FX market, euro dollar totally unchanged. Euro dollar unchanged at 122.27. I'd call it that, to be honest with you, Tom. WTI, 62.64, up about 1% or so, Lisa, this morning. I want to just set the record straight. I do not shop for private jets. Tom put that out there, and I will just argue, I can drive a car. I am not qualified to drive an airplane, nor would anybody want me to do so. What I'm watching today, though, is uh, the manufacturing of things like airplanes and other goods. Factories are uh, coming go. out. Right Thank you. I really stream. tried that. Nice the segue. Did it work? Yeah, it worked. All right, 9.45 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. We're going to be getting the U.S. May PMIs for the United States. This comes after some <laughs> European data on the PMI on the manufacturing sector, and this really goes into the higher costs of materials. This idea that it's rising to the highest levels or rising at the fastest
fastest levels that we've ever seen. How much does this crimp output? How much does this actually put a damper on factory, uh, factory production? And this, to me, is one of the conundrums with longer-term inflation. You get higher costs of these base materials. How much does that slow growth in the longer term? Meanwhile, 12.15 p.m., the Fed's Kaplan, Bostic, and Barkin are all speaking at a technology conference very at the Dallas Fed. Very interested to hear the future of work. How much does the technological advancement that we've seen over the past uh, 12 months really affect either uh, growth in the job market or perhaps even uh, a stagnation with respect to who gets jobs, how many people can be employed, and jobs that may be replaced by computers? And then also today, Joe Biden will be meeting with South Korea's President uh, Moon Jae-in. I'm very interested, first of all, to note that this is the second meeting that Joe Biden has taken at the White House following Japan talk about the emphasis on Asia. And second of all, the strategic importance of South Korea with respect to China negotiations as well as North Korea, John. Lisa, thank you. Looking forward to that. Are we going to cover this corporate tax story at all? Yeah. Are you doing that this morning? I think so. Let's 15 do it. percent is that the new minimum What's the United the States is looking for? That? I mean, how are they going to line up X They're trying to get Ireland to, to come that. up from 12 and a half. I've got Which no idea if Ireland comes up from 12 and a half. Why would they do that? And I had some sympathy for Matt Miller's argument on the early edition of Bloomberg Surveillance this morning, making the argument that shouldn't Ireland be able to make its own decisions on where its corporate tax should be? Yeah. Why should they agree to that? Yeah. Why should they? I, I don't. I, I find the whole thing odd, to be honest. I mean, I, 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 is, is, is the right word level. quixotic? Is that how you pronounce I, I it? I can John? see why the U.S. administration wants <clears throat> this to happen. I just don't know why well, Ireland would want to come along for the ride. But did you see Maria Tadeo's interview uh, with the Irish foreign minister? Basically, he came out and said that, that he could see something actually working out mid-year. They seem amenable to sure. some sort of international tax hike because it's not 21 percent. At 12 and a half? Maybe. Maybe <laughs> Let's that see. should be the minimum. Fair. I mean, okay. 21 Let's wasn't see. getting it done. 15 is clearly closer. But they've had to come all the way down to 15. I know. That's a good point. From 21. Because Ireland's not coming along for the ride. No. This and is the problem with these things. You can try and have these high-level conversations about things that should happen to try and put yourself at the epicenter of them. There is this thing called sovereignty still. I mean, is that lost on everyone, TK? Over the last no, 12 I think months, I think the countries there. get to make their own decisions you know, anymore. I think we need an explanation here, John, because you've been leading all of the financial media and the idea of getting the London New York quarter uh, up. What's the separation of Boris Johnson in London from the fractious, very dominant conservative party? I mean, I just don't I, I, I am baffled by London vaccination politics. There's a lot that I'm baffled, baffled by right now, Tom. And on the travel front, I am absolutely baffled by it. I have no idea why the Europeans yeah. are doing this one without talking to allies. And I, I want to see that happen in a bigger way. I think it's great that the Europeans are doing <clears throat> this to get travel going again. But you need to be able to go to the United States too. You need to be able to reciprocate. Yeah. That's what I'd like to see. And I just yeah. I haven't heard much about that at all. Where's the U.S. administration on this travel issue? I, I don't right know. Now, I haven't maybe, heard a maybe thing. there'll be some clarity. I, I haven't there, heard a thing. Internationally, folks, there is a difference in New York. You can feel it in the last two days. Why don't you bring in Mr. Daco? I'll do that right now. Thank you, Tom. Greg Daco joining us now, Oxford Economics Chief, U.S. Economist. Greg, you'll read on the data at the moment. We had some PMIs out of Europe. Are we seeing the same dynamics play out in Europe that we've seen play out in America over the last couple of months? Not exactly. I would say uh, the U.S. is probably a, a couple of months ahead of, of Europe uh, when it comes to the health situation, uh, and that's being reflected in the economic situation. Uh, what we're seeing in the U.S., I think, is, is just a, a very rapid uh, rebound in demand, uh, and supply is taking a little bit of time to adjust, uh, and hence the, the price pressures. Uh, the inflationary environment that we're seeing right now is, is really a feature uh, of this strong demand and this gradual mm -hmm. readjustment of, of supply. It's not a bug, uh, and it's going to be with us for, for some time. Greg, Oxford is a claim for acute GDP analysis. Are you going to recalibrate your view on GDP forward the next 12 months? Um, well, we'll certainly do that uh, at some point because uh, we know that any baseline is, is prone to be revised over time. Uh, but I think we're, we're on the right trajectory. Uh, we have uh, an outlook that's quite optimistic. Uh, we see growth uh, approaching uh, seven and a half, eight percent this year, um, moderating to about four and a half percent next year. Um, and that along with about eight million jobs being added over the course of, of this year. So uh, overall, a fairly good take on the economy led by consumer spending, uh, which will be driven by the fiscal impulse, but also some use of the excess savings that consumers have put aside 
over the past uh, 12, 15 months. To describe it with CFA level English, ginormous uh, pile of savings. What is the more likely outcome, an upside surprise in how much consumers actually spend of the savings or a downsized surprise as consumers use some of that cash to pay down uh, delayed debts as well as perhaps just get a cushion against whatever's to come? I would say in the very near term, we're, we're up for upside surprises. Um, we have an environment in which uh, consumers have a lot of excess savings. Um, a lot of these excess savings are held by higher income families, which are likely to spend it over the summer. Um, but we're also seeing that some of these lower income families have put aside or used some of the monies from check uh, checks to, to pay down debt. Uh, so there is some uh, savings buffer there, uh, and there could be some upside surprise, especially if these excess savings are considered income. If they're considered income, they're, they're more more likely to be spent if they're considered wealth, then they're less likely to be spent. And over time, um, the wealth effect we know is very small. So the, the more they're considered income, the more there are upside risks to our forecast. We're expecting consumer spending growth to be about 10% this year, which would be a record. Um, and that's going to push us well above the pre-COVID uh, environment. So there are going to be these inflationary pressures as a result of this environment of, of strong demand. Again, as supply takes a bit more time to adjust um, and, and the economy uh, just takes a, a little bit more time to get back to a pre-COVID state. Greg, got to leave it there. Always good to catch up, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Dacow there, Oxford Economics Chief, U.S. Economist. The data out of Europe today, fantastic. Upside surprises across the board on the continent. In the U.K., here's some data for you. Retail sales absolutely surging as the stores reopen. Private sector, the private sector in the oh. UK expanding at the fastest pace since at least 1998. We're getting back to business in Europe and the UK, Tom. In the blur, John, the zeitgeist yesterday, there was an image looking down a boulevard, and well, that's wrong, not a boulevard, a street in Paris, and it was jammed. And I mean, you think about all the gloom about lockdowns in Paris and Italy. I saw American Airlines is trumpeting uh, nonstops to Milan again. I mean, this is happening, John. And yep. what I would emphasize, and I could be wrong in this, John, with my I mean, I went far south yesterday. I got to 56th Street. Congratulations well, thank for that. You. But um, I really would emphasize the, the recovery that we see in New York City now. It's on a day by day basis. Two streets south of where you are. Yeah. Right now. Well, it's deep. Deer just out, Tom, deep. raising the guide, the outlook, That's full important. year net income, 5.3 to 5.7, previously 4.6 to 5. So it's another big American company looking forward and seeing a brighter future. From New York City this morning, good morning, alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Brambitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures up two tenths of 1%. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rutika Gupta. Palestinians poured into the streets of the Gaza Strip early today to celebrate a ceasefire with Israel. The Hamas militant group and Israeli forces are now observing a truce that ended 11 days of conflict. At least 232 people were killed by Israeli airstrikes and artillery fire on Gaza. A dozen died during Hamas rocket attacks on Israel. The U.S. is now calling for a global minimum corporate tax of at least 15%. That's less than the 21% rate it has proposed for the overseas earnings of U.S. businesses. Some nations had called that rate excessive. International negotiators are trying to come up with an agreement this summer. And the Biden administration is looking at ways to alleviate the global shortage of semiconductors. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo convened a meeting of executives from companies affected by the shortage. Chip makers, automakers and tech giants, producers and buyers could end up sharing supply chain information. And the EU is offering the region's battered tourist industry a chance to salvage the summer. EU negotiators have agreed on the introduction of certificates that will allow quarantine-free travel within the bloc. The coronavirus documents will offer proof their holders have been vaccinated, have recovered from the illness or have a recent negative test. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than... 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rizka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. My conversation with President Netanyahu, I commended him for the decision to bring the current hostilities to a close within less than 11 days. 
I also emphasize what I've said throughout this conflict. The United States fully supports Israel's right to defend itself against indiscriminate rocket attacks from Hamas and other Gaza-based terrorist groups that have taken the lives of innocent civilians in Israel. The President of the United States from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Bramwitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. It's the price action this Friday morning. Equity futures up 11 on the S&P. We advance a quarter of 1%. Yields are higher too. By a single basis point, your 10-year nominal yield is 163.69. In the FX market, euro dollar 122.35. And in the commodity market, just <coughs> briefly, 62.88, up about 1.5%. If we switch up the board and have a look at DIA in the pre-market, up about 8 tenths of 1%. Coming into today up by about 32% on the year so far. Yeah. So that's quite a run through 2021 so far. And they lift the outlook this morning. The guide, the outlook looks better, Tom. John, I'm going to fold it into what we heard from Gregory Daco. Too short a visit with Mr. Daco of Oxford Economics. But I, you know, his optimism there of 10% GDP folding into 7% GDP and then into a good 4% number, those are the kind of numbers that fold right over to a worldwide John Deere doing better. Yep, so Goldman just put out their VIP list, Tom, which is basically the list of the companies that the hedge funds hold and where they're most concentrated. The big five holdings are still the big tech players, mm -hmm. but the 15 new VIPs, most of them cyclical, so here are some of the names. Citigroup, General Motors, Freeport McMoran. That's where the money started to shift away from the big tech players, but still, you know what the number one holding is Facebook. in this list? <laughs> Facebook. Facebook, Lisa. Facebook, I would not have guessed that. Twenty-seven percent of monitored hedge funds own Facebook shares. Fifty-seven percent of those hold it as a top yeah. ten position. Kind of amazing to yeah, see one this. Of, yep. one I mean, of, really. Yeah, one of the reasons there is Emily Wilkins will spend twelve hours tomorrow on Facebook. She joins us now, Bloomberg government reporter in Washington. Emily, I lost Facebook like three years ago. I just said enough of this uh, foolishness. I'm going to ask you what you're doing with it. What I'm going to ask you, Emily, to me. It is a weekend in May for Washington to recalibrate. Greg Villiers mentions moments ago the tax game and the tax forward view is in shambles. There's been lots of distractions, including Israel. How do you presume Washington will recalibrate into the summer? Well, Tom, you're making a really great point here. I mean, we heard yesterday from Congressman Peter DeFazio, the head of the House Transportation Committee, that a markup that we were expecting to be critical to President Biden's infrastructure bill, that was supposed to be held next week. Now it's not going to be held until yeah. late June. And so you're starting to see these delays in the process as lawmakers realize just, I think, how complex this plan is. They're still trying to figure out whether it can be bipartisan, whether they need to go it alone. And the clock is really ticking here because certain deadlines they have to meet before this upcoming fall. And then, of course, you know, 2022, when the election stuff really gets underway, it's very hard for right. Congress to legislate on anything. Who in the Democratic Party, obviously the president, is going to be the one to corral them into some form of consensus to move forward as the Democrats recalibrate? Is it is it Speaker Pelosi? Are you watching Senator Schumer? Is it somebody I don't know? I think, Tom, you hit on the, the exact two. It is Speaker Pelosi. It is Senator Chuck Schumer. Of course, I think they are right now pushing the White House to sort of make a decision here. Chuck Schumer has already said that he is worried about if Congress waits too long to start actually moving on something, if Democrats wait too long to have Republicans give a yay or nay on whether they're going to go at it with Democrats, then this is going to be more time that the Democrats don't spend. You know, I was speaking with someone yesterday on the Hill who was saying, look, this plan, we need it to pass, and then we need to start actually seeing productive results before November of 2022. So when lawmakers go up for re-election, that they're actually able to point to shovels in ground, saying, you know, look, we passed this bill, and now things are actually getting done. The longer right. they wait, the longer it's just a proposal, and none of the voters in America are actually seeing any changes. Emily, which raises the question of how much ground the Democrats are willing to give up. And I wonder, as we take a look at that 15 percent minimum tax globally uh, that the U.S. is currently proposing on corporations, whether that is giving a lot of ground, how that's being received by fellow Democrats after initially proposing a 21 percent uh, global minimum tax rate. Yes, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has called that 15 percent proposal the floor. It's clear that she's hoping to be able to negotiate up higher, although I know you guys were just talking about the fact that 
15% is still higher than what you're seeing other countries propose. Look, we are seeing sort of the rubber hit the road on this tax plan. Yesterday, Bloomberg reported that uh, Richard Neal, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, the very powerful House Tax Committee, was starting to question whether they need to tweak President Biden's proposal on those step-up in basis taxes, the ones that deal with how much tax heirs need to pay on the assets that they inherit. And they were suggesting that maybe instead of paying the taxes when they get those assets, they could delay it for a little longer. So look, you are seeing Democrats try and figure out what the exact contours of President Biden's plan need to be. Yeah. Because remember, even if Democrats decide to go this alone, this is not going to be easy. They have to get progressives and moderates all on the same page. And right now, that that is not the case. Before we let you go, we, we just got dear earnings. And one of the most interesting aspects was that they indicated that they see increased supply chain pressures through the rest of this year. This is probably the most common theme that we're hearing from all of the big industrial companies. We also saw out of the PMIs that the industrial pressures being placed in Europe are also rising. Yesterday, Gina Raimondo held this summit on how to ease some of these concerns. What is the timeline for anything to actually get done on that? In other words, how soon could that actually ease the supply chain issues that we're seeing now? I mean, I know that both the White House and lawmakers and Congress are working on this issue as quickly as possible. It's going to be something that President Biden winds up met, um, mess meeting with today for South Korean President Moon. It's definitely going to be a topic of discussion, uh, both on the supply lines, on the semiconductor shortages. That's going to be a big focus of Moon's trip. He's actually going to a plant in Atlanta on Saturday to sort of look at this issue further. And so this is something that Washington definitely has its eye on, but tying it back to Tom's original point, there is a lot going on right now. And you're right, there's sort of a, a rush to get everything done at once at this point before those 2022 elections. Emily, thank you. Emily, Got to leave it there. Emily Wilkins down in DC, our Bloomberg government reporter. And Lisa on the PMIs out of Europe. This is the commentary coming from IHS Market for Germany. Supply shortages curbing production levels and weighing on new orders due to forced downtime. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You can just take that quote and insert any country right now in Europe, in America. Yeah, and this is really the prevailing theme and really the unknowns include how long this is going to last, how much this will crimp growth and supply, just to also give you a sense of how much this is jacking up prices. The price subcomponents of the PMI in the Eurozone for manufa the manufacturing sector showed that almost 90% of companies had to pay more for their intermediate inputs in May. That is the theme right now worldwide. From New York City this morning, good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, Elisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Equity futures are advancing 13 on the S&P. We're up about a third of 1%. In the bond market, yields higher by a single basis point to 163.69. In foreign exchange, getting comfortable with a 122 handle this week. 122, 33. There we go, Tom. And crude higher, up by 1.6%, $62 and about 93 cents. More still to come from New York. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Stocks are positive. The dollar's weaker for a second straight day. 89 handle on the dollar index. Getting comfortable around those levels and on euro dollar in and around 122. That's the story of foreign exchange. Here's the story of the equity market right now. Up a third of 1% on the S&P. Coming into Friday down just a nudge. That's Tom's word of the morning. Just a nudge. nudge. Down just a little Very bit, nudging. TK. Yeah, the Nasdaq right now down by about, up rather, by about a third of 1%. <clears> the <throat> Russell up by about a half of 1%. The data out of Europe, pretty tidy. I'll talk about that in just a moment. If you switch up the board and get to the bond market, twos, tens, thirties, your 10-year nominal yield has done pretty much nothing. Through the week, we've had some movement, but on the week, going nowhere. 163, 35 on tens, 234 on a 30. Your nominal yield has been stable on the week. Break-evens <clears> have come in because real yields have started to push back out. And that's the calculation for break-evens. It's the nominal minus the real and a gap in between. And that spread's been getting wider over the last year or so, Tom. And everybody's always talking about it. Break-evens, inflation expectations. Every right, time right, you get right. a move, it's not it. nice. It's always inflation. It's inflation. Ah, this week's been about real yields, Tom. Real yields started to come back a little bit. And I know you've been on top of that, too. Yeah, the real yield story to me is 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 definitely there, John, and, and I think it comes up to the combination of economic data. I'm going to again go back to Greg Daco as an uber optimist. What, John, does real yields do if you get the uber optimism? I don't know. You get a reprice if you get a taper. 
Is that what we got a little hint of this that's, week? That's the consensus. That we, we which all my radar's of? up when I, you know, the certitude of taper tantrum I really have trouble with. This summer could get a little bit more interesting. Switch up the board and finish on this over in Europe. Have we got to this place where the story's really well known? In Europe, the data was terrific this morning. Fantastic. Yes. What do deals do? Buns coming <clears> three basis points in Italy down about a basis point in Germany. We've had a lot of repricing here, despite the fact we hadn't seen the data in Europe perform the way it had in America. Right. Now we're starting to see the data. You can see in the upside surprises. Have a look at the City Index, the Bloomberg Index in Europe. It's going this way, up. In the United States, it's going this way, down. But this story in Europe has been getting priced through the year, Tom. In bonds, more recently, and in equities over the last six months, you've seen the bank stocks absolutely yeah, rip. And over the last six months. John, I'd really fold it into almost a cultural issue or social issue, the drought, the grimness of the vaccine in Europe, and that has been sharply reversed. And, you know, we see the enthusiasm, particularly in Germany in the week. John, with the festivities in Bitcoin and with our good guest coming up, I want to do this board with John Farrow uh, right now because it really goes to the, the, what we've tried to do with Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin Pro and Bitcoin Anti People. Bring up that board, if you would. All right, now, John, I'm sorry. Gold, there's the movement, 2% on the week. There's one of the European great pairs. This is incredibly important for Eastern Europe mortgage pricing, some kind of stasis. And there's a volatility of Bitcoin. John Farrow, is Bitcoin a gold or currency equivalent? Before we get to Bitcoin, can we have a look at that Swiss franc foreign cross that you've just put up? Yeah. TK, coming out of the last crisis, people will remember there were a lot of mortgages taken out in Eastern Europe yep. in Swiss francs. And when we got that adverse move away from what you were denominated in and what you earned your money in towards the Swiss e Tom, some of those mortgages got absolutely yeah. hammered. I haven't looked at that cross for a long, long time. I wanted to, I wanted, I, you know, I, I know you'll tear up on it, John, but I wanted to bring it here. Right now, Rebecca Patterson joins us. We are thrilled to have her with us. She's with Bridgewater director of investment research, but far more is her time on the street, bringing holistically together the foreign exchange market with everything else out there. Uh, Rebecca, wonderful to have you with us today. On Bitcoin, what did we learn this week? I put up there some of the dynamics, the silliness of it being a gold equivalent or a coin equivalent. What did we learn? Uh, I think uh, we got reaffirmation that it's a speculative asset and it still has a long ways to go to become a gold equivalent, to become a proper storehold of wealth, something that you can count on to have purchasing power over time that's going to have stable and relatively low volatility. This was not a low volatility week or so for Bitcoin, quite the contrary. Rebecca, do you see a generational divide between certain age groups who believe this is the new gold and other age groups that just do not? Anecdotally, yes. Anecdotally, it does seem that people who are looking for alternative uh, sources of cash, if you will, um, you do have a bit of a younger generation bias towards the cryptocurrencies versus gold. But um, you know, it, it, to me, it's, it's not the generation as much as the retail versus the institutional. The, the money that's going into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies today is still largely retail. Of course, you're getting a few more corporations, you're getting family offices, you're getting some hedge funds, but the large institutional money that's thinking about, do I want this as part of the diversifying assets in my portfolio to protect me from drawdowns, from, from bad periods of, of market stress, we're not there yet. It might get there over time, but it's not there yet. So this is still an asset that I think is primarily one to be used for return and speculation, not over to, time, not to hold. Over time, though, Rebecca, do you think that investor conditioning kicks in? Many people will ask us when they're not familiar with financial markets and macro, why does the yen do so well when things get bad? And there are various ways of explaining that, but one of them is it just does well. It's worked <laughs> and it's worked historically. Do we need to be conditioned by this somehow to start believing it a little bit more? Well, I, I think over time, you, you could see that environment come together. And there's a couple of things I'd be watching. The big one right now is the regulatory ecosystem. It, you know, it, it's very immature still for cryptocurrencies. And after the uh, colonial pipeline hack paid for with crypto, the ransom was paid for crypto, I think you are going to see regulators in the U.S. focusing more on this, trying to make sure there isn't illicit activity, trying to increase transparency. That might make some holders of Bitcoin not want to own it anymore. They're there for the anonymity, but it could create an ecosystem that gives more 
um, credibility to it, more encouragement for large institutional players to come in. If they come in and you have another source of liquidity there, that could bring down volatility over time. That's the positive flywheel that I think could change how Bitcoin and, and perhaps other cryptocurrencies are perceived. Obviously, there's the environmental issues too, which are, are clearly a problem for some investors. I think those things need to get addressed and the volatility needs to come down. But if those things can happen, I think this could evolve into some some type of digital gold, if you will. Rebecca, I want you to elaborate on the environmental concerns because Elon Musk of Tesla highlighted this and you highlighted this in a recent research report showing that Bitcoin uses up more energy than say even uh, Switzerland when you take a look at the energy consumption. It's basically a nation unto itself when it comes to this area. Can this be solved? How big of a concern is this for certain investors? Well, increasingly, investors are focusing on, on environmental and other ESG um, issues. So, so it is an increasing concern for a lot of large institutions. There are ways it can be addressed. You can see changes in the technology used in Bitcoin, for example, that could reduce energy usage. Uh, you could see the type of energy used, you know, more of a focus on renewable energy. That could also be a positive trend. There's also another option here, which is that another cryptocurrency that has lower energy usage, but also some of the positive characteristics like limited supply, you could see that supplant Bitcoin. You know, just because Bitcoin is the dominant currency today doesn't mean it'll always be. So I think there are some different paths, but over time it's going to get addressed one way or another. Meanwhile, Rebecca, I want to pick up on something that John was talking about, because I know that this dovetails into the inflation call that Bridgewater has had, this whole cash is trash and uh, that Ray Dalio was talking about, but moving forward, that inflation is going to be more of a threat. What do you make of the move recently lower in longer term break even rates? Basically, longer term inflation expectations have come down even as we get this robust data. Yeah, I mean, our, this is such an unusual time, right? We're seeing the biggest U.S. boom um, that we've had in decades. And we have so many different cross currents given the reopenings coming out of the pandemic, demand rising faster than some supply can meet it. And you just mentioned that a few minutes ago in the European PMI data. That, that it's hard to have a high degree of confidence how this is going to play out. But as we look at the year or so ahead, we see a, a decent amount of risk that inflation could keep rising, it's already rising, but stay higher for longer. And part of that is the supply taking a while to catch up with the increasing demand. And part of it is more structural forces. You know, globalization, which has helped reduce inflation for years, that's been plateauing and, and could possibly reverse a little bit. The, the trend towards capital over labor, that's starting to reverse a little bit as you see higher wages, higher minimum wages, et cetera. Um, and so if you see some of these secular forces slowing or reversing somewhat and these cyclical forces, we think you could be in a slightly higher inflation mm -hmm. environment. So the day-to-day -day moves aside, I think you want to be looking as an investor, does my portfolio have enough protection if that risk becomes reality? And this isn't just as the Fed likes to say, transitory inflation. Rebecca, I want to get in trouble with Ray Dalio, so I'm going to ask a rude question, and you're such a pro, you'll give me an honest answer. Right now, stock bond correlations are really quite odd. That goes into rate parity strategies and such. What is the duration, the timeline of this odd correlation where it begins to affect portfolios? We're hearing short term, no big deal. When does no big deal become a big deal? So Tom, I think I don't think that's a rude question at all. I think you're you're highlighting a couple things that that are worth unpacking a little bit. Um, first, when we think about risk parity strategies, all weather, which is our our strategy, it's it's a strategic long-term asset allocation. What we're trying to do is get rid of some of the volatility that can come with changes in economic environments, growth, inflation. And what that allows us to do is get more steady returns over time. And then we can compound that, which is, as Einstein said, isn't it the eighth wonder of the world? Um, so that's a very different strategy than, say, pure alpha, where we're really focusing on uncorrelated return streams that are over shorter time periods. It's more tactical. Um, for, for folks who are thinking about a risk parity strategy, remember, it's never been determined on one asset or one country. It's going to be a balanced mix of assets. So even if bond yields rise, 
Um, there are going to be other bonds that are still attractive. China, for example, the 10 year yield there is still 3%, much more normal policy mix going on. And then you're going to have other assets that are going to give you that diversification and that balance, no matter what the environment is. But the other thing, Tom, that I think is really important that you just said is about correlation. And I think you know, every 60, 40 portfolios over the last couple of decades have just been able to sit back and let it roll in. You've had rising stocks and falling bond yields. And today there is a chance that you're gonna see that relationship break apart. And you need to understand why that's happening and then what you do about it. If we think that relationship is breaking apart in part because of inflation, then you wanna make sure that you don't have too many bonds. You wanna make sure that you also have other assets to protect you against that risk, whether it's gold, which has been recovering nicely recently, inflation linked bonds, even equities that give you more of a steady cash flow over time that aren't going to be as um, vulnerable to that duration issue. Rebecca, always smart and always enjoy your contribution. Rebecca Patterson there, Bridgewater Director of Investment Research from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keen, Lisa Brambitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. President Biden says the U.S. will help Gaza with humanitarian aid in the wake of that 11-day conflict with Israeli forces. The ceasefire brokered by Egypt took effect early today. Israeli warplanes and artillery pounded Gaza, whilst Hamas militants fired rockets at Israel. At least 232 Palestinians were killed. 12 people were killed in Israel. The Fed is now looking into a digital dollar. Chairman Jerome Powell says the central bank will publish a research paper and seek public comment on digital currencies. The focus will be on how a digital dollar could improve an already safe system. China is already moving ahead with a digital yuan. Tesla CEO Elon Musk may have set his sights on Russia. In a virtual conference today, Musk said Russia is amongst the countries where the electric car maker potentially could build a factory. He also said there should be more dialogue between Russia and the US. And Apple puts its star witness on the stand today in that antitrust trial with Epic Games. CEO Tim Cook is scheduled to be the last person to testify in the courtroom in Oakland, California. He's expected to argue that Apple's rules for its app store ensure a seamless user experience and that developers can make good money. Global News 24 hours a day on air. And on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. don't want to declare victory prematurely, but if we can get the 70% of adults vaccinated with at least one dose by the 4th of July, the way the president has set the goal, I think the chances of there being a surge or a rebound is extremely low. That's the reason why we want to continue to get people vaccinated. The message from Dr. Fauci there from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keen, Lisa Bramvitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Counting you down to the opening bow with futures looking like this on the S&P. Up 11 points, we advance a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. Just a little bit softer, lower on the week on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yield unchanged, call it a basis point higher. We're at 163.35. And euro dollar muted price action here, TK. Euro dollar yeah. 122.27, unchanged on the day. And the VIX 19 to 27 comes back in with all the nudge churning of the week. 20.64 on the VIX gives the uh, bullish feel of this morning. What we've tried to do for, what is it, 14, 15, 16 months in a recovering America is bring you the smartest people we can find, the adults of medicine uh, in this terrible pandemic. One of those would be Stuart Ray. He's with Johns Hopkins out of Vanderbilt. And what is so important about Dr. Ray's work is he has traipsed from HIV to hepatitis C and now on to COVID. You can go back to, I love this, Dr. Ray, a stable latent reservoir for HIV-1 and resting CD4 plus T lymphocytes in infected children, a jewel from 20 years ago. Dr. Ray, you have decades of experience in the path of what we learn in a pandemic. 
Where are we in that sequence with COVID? Are we still newbies or are we actually really getting a handle on this unique virus? I think there's a huge range of, of statuses. Uh, we've come so far on vaccines and we've come uh, so far on getting the rates of infection and severity down, uh, but we still have some headwinds and we're learning a lot about how this virus is spread and what makes someone susceptible. Uh, so we've got a lot to learn, but I think it's amazing that we've come as far as we have in a year and a half. How do you respond to a baseball field of 40,000 seats that will have 15,000 people in them randomly this weekend, say this Friday evening. Are you comfortable with that? I am. I think that uh, we don't completely understand this, but open air is an amazingly protective thing. And uh, people still need to be careful about how they get to those seats and how they go from those seats and what they do in the corridors uh, between uh, the time that they're in those seats. But I think that that time in the seats is probably not the riskiest thing those people will do that day. Dr. Ray, let's talk about what's potentially riskier at a time when we're being advised that if we've gotten vaccinated, we don't have to wear our masks in most places. This is the ad advisement from the CDC. Is that accurate? Is that advisable given this data, given the science that you are studying? Well, I think it's important what you hear when you when those words are said, because what it's, what's being said is you don't have to. Uh, it doesn't mean you shouldn't. And we have to think about the most vulnerable among us and what will help get rates low. Right now, we have pretty high rates of transmission still, uh, you know, similar to where we were a year ago. Uh, but we have more people who are immune. And uh, when people are immune, they're protected from severe disease. But there are people around them who may still be susceptible. And we still need to learn about how we protect those people. Well, Dr. Ray, can you clear up some misconceptions? Because frankly, I am not clear on just how infectious somebody who's been vaccinated is, should they contract the, the, the virus, even if perhaps they don't get very sick. What is the data? What is the epidemiological work showing on that front? Well, we know that people who've been vaccinated have a, a lower rate, much lower rate of getting sick. And when they get sick, uh, we see that they don't get severe disease or death. The problem is that we still get positive. So we're still seeing a substantial number of people who've been fully vaccinated uh, getting hospitalized. Uh, and those people still have positive tests. So we know that they can uh, harbor the virus. And we have some evidence that they can spread it. But it's a much lower rate than it was before they got vaccinated. Yesterday, Dr. Ray, in a New York City that is clearly becoming more buoyant, more visibly back to normal, I heard so much talk of fear of variants, and this is from people qualified and, frankly, too many people unqualified. Do you have a fear of variants? Well, my fear is, is more for the population than for the individual. I think that if you're fully vaccinated and your immune system is not impaired by medicines we give or other conditions you might have, then those variants really don't pose a great risk. So the vaccines are very effective against these variants in preventing severe disease. The problem is that these variants uh, raise the infectivity of the virus so much that the threshold, the herd immunity threshold we need, the number of people vaccinated or proportion of people vaccinated, we need to protect the population from uh, spreading of this virus is now higher. So the more infectious the, the virus, the more people we need to vaccinate to get to the point where we don't get kindling of an epidemic. And so now instead of, you know, initially maybe 60 or 70 percent uh, threshold, we need more like 80, 90 percent of people to be vaccinated. And that makes it harder to get there, especially if there's hesitancy about it. Stuart, how do we know what the emerging dominant strain is if we have such limited sequencing in the U.S. compared to, say, the U.K.? Well, uh, it's true that the U.K. got ahead of us on this, but we've made a lot of uh, advances in this. And we're now sequencing more than 10 percent of all uh, positives in the state of Maryland. And I think many jurisdictions have done the same thing. So we've ramped up that capacity. We have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Now, right now, what's happening is that the B117 variant that was first identified in Kent in the U.K. is now the dominant strain with like 80 percent of infections uh, uh, being caused by that one. But we now see the rise of some other variants as well. And so we have to keep an eye on that. We need to make sure the molecular epidemiology is happening. 
Doctor, always good to get you on the show. Come back soon, sir. Thank you. Dr. Stuart Ray Thank there, you. Johns Hopkins Professor of Infectious <laughs> Diseases on some of the issues playing out right now. On, on the emerging dominant strain, the variant first identified in India, Tom, seems to be yeah. the concern in the UK. And I just wondered to what degree that's going to hold back travel arrangements later this summer. What I find sobering is the pros don't know. I mean, we're all running around looking for certitude, whether it's the kids to camp or, you know, airlines, as we talked about earlier, John. But the answer is the pros don't have a clue. They're learning as they go. We ought to have respect for that. Always something to worry about, Lisa. Yeah, I, I, oh, yeah. So true. Without a doubt, there's always something to worry about. I'm definitely a prime candidate for that. I do want to just note one thing that really caught my eye. Taiwan saying to the United States, you want some of these chip shortages solved? Give us more vaccine. This idea of trying to dovetail directly the vaccine accessibility to <clears throat> some of the chip shortages that we're seeing. Vaccine diplomacy. Yes. No, you called. know, seriously. I mean, the Thank you. John, the helicopter was out this morning, so I took a car in and I talked to the driver. My biggest mystery is Japan. Seriously, I, I just... Yeah, how slow it's yeah. been. I just don't... I, I literally don't understand it. I have to read about it this weekend. How close are we to the Olympics, Tom? Pardon? How close are we to the Olympics? We're close, and it's a raging battle in Japan. I'm not read in on that, but what I know is I would have thought Japan would have been out front on vaccine efficacy, and I think not it's the so opposite. Much. Well, yeah, uh, Japanese Prime Minister this morning was saying he wants to hold a safe, secure Olympics with virus uh, precautions. Yeah. This, so he's good, still planning on the on the Olympics. Oh, I think most people are planning on the Olympics Let's see happening. If it happens. July twenty third. Yeah, coming up. Coming up a little bit later, break. in the next couple of months, from New York, alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Abramovich, I'm Jonathan Farrow, taking you towards the weekend. We're all looking forward to that. This is Bloomberg. All this money sloshing around, these incredibly low interest rates, I think we risk an inflation surge. If the economy stays as strong as it is, fueled by all of the stimulus that was put behind it, you get inflation. The Fed is likely to start to shift their, their policy stance in the coming months. We've never had a situation historically where the Fed has not begun to normalize rates and there is an inflation concern in the markets. No one knows if these inflation pressures are going to prove more transitory or or less transitory. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Equity markets this morning, positive 10 points on the S&P. We're up by about two-tenths of 1%. Tom, we had some PMIs out of Europe earlier. Decent, better than expected. Some PMIs out of America yeah. a little bit later. I think that's the right language, John. Decent, better than expected really sets us up for the weekend as, as well. What I would note, John, is a NASDAQ 100 gives you decent and better expected off the mat of gloom, the pendulum of gloom we saw, say, on Wednesday or Tuesday, we've got a nice 4% move in NASDAQ 100. The NASDAQ up two-tenths of 1%. The big test taking place in this labor market right now, Tom, the division between labor yeah. demand and labor supply. And that's been the debate once again this week. You are dead on. It's the microeconomics of labor. That's what small business, big business is worrying about. We're going to talk about that in a moment as we went to Montana yesterday. We're going to go to Minnesota on it. But it's truly nationwide, John, and, and we're just going to have to see where that goes. 3.8% unemployment rate in Montana. Wow. Real-life case study playing out now, Lisa, in this country with more than 20 Republican states saying no, no more additional UI. It's time to get back to work. Now, that's their view. Let's see how that works out. Yeah, although there was a Gina Smilek uh, tweet out yesterday of the New York Times where she was highlighting a Federal Reserve report. I know you picked up on that, John, talking about how this is just a small component to some of the labor market shortages, the enhanced unemployment uh, benefits that people have been receiving. It is a complicated issue. The frictions are enormous as we try to restart a massive global economy all at once, John. Let's run through the price action this morning, Lisa, starting with equity futures up about 11 on the S&P 500, advancing a third of 1% into the bond market with yields higher by about a basis point on tens at 163.35. Euro dollar just slightly negative. This is one you've got to try and get your head around. The data better than expected, the euro 
negative, down about a tenth of 1%, Lisa, 122.19. Yeah, try to get your head around a lot of market reaction to a lot of the data that we've been getting. And, you know, good luck, you'll have a confusing day. I will say, you mentioned PMIs. In 9.45 a.m., we do get that ISM data from the U.S., or excuse me, market data from the U.S. The idea will be we'll get manufacturing and services information. <laughs> I want to highlight once again the frictions. We can see the frictions on every front. Increased input prices, supply chain disruptions, labor shortages. Are these temporary? Are these long lasting? Will we get guidance from companies with some of these uh, data points with respect to how long they expect some of these factors to uh, crimp their businesses? Then at 12.15 p.m., sort of talking about the transition of the global economy, the Dallas Fed is going to be holding a summit on technological disruptions, the future of work post-pandemic hearing from Robert Kaplan, Raphael Bostic, and Tom Barkin, all of the Fed coming out, talking about what it means for a labor force with more automation, with higher skilled workers more in demand, with many more people uh, demanding higher wages. How long lasting could that be? And today, Joe Biden, president of the United States, is meeting with the South Korean prime minister. The question here to me really is how they're going to address some of these supply chain shortages, how they're going to address some of the diplomatic issues in the South China Sea with respect to to South Korea and China with respect to how they deal with North Korea. But, John, interesting again to note that the first two meetings that Joe Biden held, both with Asian countries, Japan and yeah, South Korea. That's where the emphasis is in the early days. Then next month, it's Europe. The president <clears throat> with his first overseas trip to the continent. His first overseas trip of the presidency, Tom. He'll be going to Brussels, I believe. He'll be going to the UK as well. I want to have a look at Deer just quickly in the pre-market. Up by more than 1% in early trading. Positive 1.35%, adding to the 30-something percentage point gain we've seen so far year today already. Lifting the profit outlook, Tom. Surging farm yeah. sector demand. The headline this morning from the team at Bloomberg. And, John, what's so important here is the guests we've got coming up. I mean, you look at the boom economy out where he lives, and he's just screaming the deer utility tractor, the 80, 89 horsepower. Uh, it's it's big, John. I mean, it's it's enough to get Jim through the weekend. <laughs> More CFA but language. Not too big. big. It's not like embarrassing not big, big like some of his neighbors. It's nudgy. Right? Oh. Let's nudgy. get to Jim Paulson, shall we? Yeah. Standing by patiently, the Little Crew <laughs> Chief <laughs> Investment Strategist. Jim, it's great to catch up as always. We've had a market in some places absolutely ripping. And as Jonathan Golub at Credit Suisse pointed out, you can have huge price gains but still have a valuation a multiple that comes in because profits and profit expectations are up even more and the profit numbers have just been incredible the earnings Jim through Q1 just quite fantastic I, I agree Jonathan the um, I, the numbers in the first quarter for the SP 500 have come in at a $200 <coughs> annualized rate um, I think the full year numbers on expectations right now are around 185 for this year. So I, Wall Street's way behind what corporations are already coining in the first quarter. If they're doing 200 rate in the first quarter, we're going to be way above $200 for the year. So it's very hard, I think. Um, we, you know, $185 is a huge improvement. I, I just recently looked back at. Uh, uh, you know, coming from the, the lows of earnings going all the way back to 1950 and saying um, when, uh, how long, if you look at one year from the low in the earnings uh, in the S&P 500, how much was that relative to the previous cycle's peak earnings? And most of those are, are down yet one year into the new recovery that you're still not even back to peak earnings. If we come in at, let's say, $200, $215 earnings this year, uh, one year after the low, basically, in l earnings, which was the end of last year, we're, we're going to be up some 40 percent almost from the previous cycle peak, which just blows away anything else we've ever done in the post-war era in a new expansion. So I think Wall Street in general and economists and uh, everyone, companies are having a really difficult yeah. time keeping up with how fast fundamentals are improving. Now, to the PhD from Ames, Iowa, what I'm going to say, Jim Paulson, is if you go north on Route 35 out of Ames, Iowa, when in doubt, America always has to buy another tractor. I mean, that's what we do. We're optimistic. <laughs> We're out there. There's a boom economy. Dear, we need a new tractor. Is that mood out there right now? And what does that mean for the underestimation of where we are? I, I think it is, Tom. I, I think there's burgeoning optimism here. Of, you know, if nothing else, just just getting your shot in the arm and, and feeling some sense of normalcy 
has really elevated not just spirits, but animal spirits, I think, of, of getting back to, uh, to work, it, uh, going at it again. Um, you know, I, I, you certainly see everything here just booming again. Traffic, you know, is just something that we haven't seen for a while here that uh, you're, you're dealing with again as people are yeah. actually going down to work. The downtown is coming back to life. You know, so I, I, I think companies are starting to reevaluate. The thing that we, we did here is we, we went from a depressionary bust to a wartime boom within less than a year. And so companies were trying to survive a pandemic and cut everything to the bone, payrolls, inventories, output, just to be able to survive. And then suddenly they were given a wartime boom. And now we're, and as a result, we, we're trying to catch up because suddenly we don't have enough labor, we don't have enough shipping containers, we don't have enough homes, we don't have enough chips. But I think given a year, uh, uh, capitalists will catch up. Right. And, and, uh, and the unemployment benefits will wear out and there will be more labor supply and uh, I think we'll, we will catch up. So Jim, there's a question of who benefits the most from this circumstance. Who could take advantage of the incredible surging demand? And increasingly it looks like it's the big companies with respect to their ability to pay employees more to lure workers into their workforce. This according to a Wall Street Journal article where small businesses were complaining that it was hard for them to compete with the behemoths. And we've seen the behemoths increasingly gain share. As a stock investor, being agnostic as to whether this is good or bad for the overall economy, Economy. Do you bet on the bigger companies being able to succeed more in this kind of environment than smaller companies? You know, uh, actually, I'm betting just the other way around. I, I really like small cap stocks. Um, I, I think that um, I, I look at the small cap earnings. They're doing every bit as good. Actually, those earnings are coming back even faster than large cap earnings um, overall. So I think they have greater leverage to the economy which is what you want to be. I think they have, uh, they do better in reinflationary environments where prices go up. Look, the difference between large companies and small companies, large companies have wider margins, let's say 10%. Small companies operate with narrower margins, let's say 5%. So if you get pricing flexibility on top line and you can lift prices 1%, that's a that's a much bigger uh, that's a much bigger impact for a smart smaller margin company than it is for large margin companies. So their earnings have greater leverage to inflation, and so I, I think small companies are doing good. And and they're uh, you know after after many of them didn't make it, but those that are I think have a lot of operating leverage in their system. Jim. Good to hear from you. As always, Jim Paulson there, the Luthold Group Chief Investment Strategist. Your market this morning up by about a third of 1% on the S&P, advancing about 13 points. The argument that Jim and Jonathan Golub over at Credit Suisse are making right now, TK, is that the yeah. profits have been so great, you can still have this market where you have this huge <coughs> price action, but it gets cheaper, and it gets cheaper because the earnings have been so terrific. And that's the bullish view right now, at least, on Wall Street. Well, the percent change one year speaks to John Golub and other bulls that we speak to. I'll let you line them up. Uh, John, NASDAQ up 46 percent. That's a composite. SPX up 41 percent, 12 months trailing. The Dow lags terribly up 39 percent. Golub's at 4,600, I think, on the S&P, Tom. 41, I mean, you know, 68 I wanna, right I now. I want to be careful here, folks. We're not trying to give our opinion. We're just framing out what people view, whether it's Paulson's economics in Minnesota yeah. or Golub's uh, stock strategy on the island of Manhattan. I'm catching up with Jonathan Golub a little bit later. Oh, are you on one of the other properties? Eastern Time. That's good. Yeah, catching See, up with Bob Michael at J.P. Morgan, Mohammed Al Arian. <clears throat> a little bit keep later, on, too. Keep going, you know, bring it up. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the lineup later. I'm looking forward to that in the 9 o'clock hour. Stay tuned. You're going to look up and watch that from the radio booth. No, I'm going to, going into a meeting. We're doing a conference <laughs> call on Harry Kane and what the likelihood. I'm watching whilst, reruns of whilst, Jenny Ellen. Well, she meant to be on radio. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. We're Tom Keane, Lisa Abramovitz, Jonathan Farrow, counting yeah. it down to the opening bell. Two hours and about 20 minutes away. Equities up 13. We advance one third of one percent in the bond market. Yields unchanged at 163.18. In the FX market, euro dollar 122.17, down about a tenth of 1% there. And crude doing okay, 62.86, up about 1%. Entry one point, bit dog. Percent. Mm -hmm. You have a look, Tom. I'm Do looking. some technical analysis in the commercial. I have the break. Bloomberg terminal. On radio, on TV, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Palestinians poured into the streets of the Gaza Strip early today to celebrate 
A ceasefire with Israel, the Hamas militant group and Israeli forces are now observing a truce that ended 11 days of conflict. At least 232 people were killed by Israeli airstrikes and artillery fire on Gaza. A dozen died during Hamas rocket attacks on Israel. The U.S. is now calling for a global minimum corporate tax of at least 15 percent. That's less than the 21 percent rate it has proposed for the overseas earnings of U.S. businesses. Some nations had called that rate excessive. International negotiators are trying to come up with an agreement this summer. And the European Union is offering the region's battered tourist industry a chance to salvage the summer. EU negotiators have agreed on the introduction of certificates that will allow quarantine-free travel within the bloc. The coronavirus documents will offer proof their holders have been vaccinated, have recovered from the illness or have a recent negative test. And one of the largest insurance companies in the U.S. paid $40 million in March to hackers after a ransomware attack. Bloomberg's learned that CNA Financial Group paid about two weeks after a company trove of data was stolen. That payment was bigger than previously disclosed ransom. CNA says the company followed the law. And Facebook is now the most favorite long position amongst hedge funds. That's according to Goldman Sachs. Sachs says 27% of monitored hedge funds own Facebook shares. The next four companies on that list are Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and Alibaba. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. fully expect that over the coming months, these misalignments are going to work themselves out uh, because we do have a market and that we will get back to a full recovery and that by the end of the year, we're going to be, you know, in really good shape. Good to catch up with Cecilia Rouse there yesterday, the Council of Economic Advisors Chair from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's your equity market up around about 14 on the S&P. We advance a third of 1%. Your bond market unchanged, 10 years, 162.84. That's your yield. In the FX market, euro dollar 122.20. Negative. And if you're waking up just now, well, good morning to you. Uh, your PMI's out of Europe. Nice upside surprise. Not doing much for the euro. Your PMI's out of America coming a little bit later this morning, I believe 9.45 Eastern. And Lisa mentioned the Fed speak at the top of the hour. Kaplan Bostic barking, talking a little bit later. If this wasn't a technology conference, I would have thought those three might have something to say about the taper discussion oh, in think? a bigger way. Oh, yeah. yeah but they're not going to, right? Well, are Don't they, know. though? Well, let's they be might. clear. Moderating the panel is Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes. So well, let's see which, nails, which direction so, Kathleen know. takes this conversation. Yeah, she'll be, okay, enough of silicon. Let's go. What's the taper story? Hopefully. We'll see what she says. Futures up 14. I'm seeing a little bit of pop to the tape green on the screen uh, this morning. Right now in Washington, Josh Wingrove joins us, and he's got a really twisted view coming out of Canada. And after the Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens last night, we speak to Mr. Wingrove, our White House correspondent as well. Josh, I want to compare and contrast the liberality of Canadian politics with the liberals in Washington. As we were talking to Emily Wilkins earlier, it's been a week, a jumble week, maybe a transitional week here. Where are liberals transitioning to in Washington? Well, I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, that transition we're seeing this week is over that issue of Israel uh, and the situation in Gaza. Biden has been under pressure from his progressive wing to, you know, show a little more daylight with uh, Israel, with Netanyahu. And he really has resisted that. Of course, we saw him last night take that almost victory lap, if you will, after the ceasefire uh, was announced and sort of expressing hope that both Israelis and, and Palestinians can live in peace, but also pledging to replenish the Iron Dome. So, sort of a signal to progressives that, you know, this we're, we're not we're not pulling around 180 degrees here. So, you know, Biden has been trying this whole time to hold together, hold together the party. I think with uh, doing a little better than people have expected, but you know, time will tell. Uh, but you guys, you you need to give Emily a day off one of these days. My gosh, she's working hard for you. Well, she's been doing a great job, and of course, that's <laughs> about the white marble up at Congress. Tell us about the mood at the White House. I mean, we're more than 100 days in, and there's a dynamic, and there's a schedule. We're all getting used to it. A big difference from the previous administration. What is the mood at your White House? I mean, they are sort of settling in. As you mentioned, they have uh, a big day today. They've got the meeting with the South Korean president. We think that chip shortage is going to play a big role in it. Biden and President Moon are going to speak at 5 
p.m. today, so we'll be watching that closely. This is only the second time he's had uh, an in-person meeting with a foreign leader. But, yeah, I mean, they're sort of, you know, settling in for the long haul. Remember, this Biden White House is staffed with people that worked in the Obama White House and in the Clinton White House. Those White Houses lost their House majorities in the midterm elections. You know, there's a sense in Biden that there's no point in, you know, gearing down and, and doing things slowly. It's like, go big or go home is the mantra, and that's what we're going to see from them as they, of course, continue to pitch that American jobs plan and, in particular, look at whether that infrastructure part of it might get split off into its own bipartisan deal. And then, to be clear, Josh, it seems as if that bipartisan part is getting split off, is most likely to get done as probably a 500 to 800 billion dollar plan with bipartisan support. What comes next? How likely is it that there's enough of a consensus among Democrats to get the rest of Biden's agenda through? Uh, I think there's a consensus to get some of it through, <laughs> maybe not all of it. I mean, Biden has been clear that he wants to try that. So, you know, as you say, split off what can be done bipartisan uh, on a bipartisan basis and then push forward the rest with Democrats. You know, there's dispute even among Democrats around the, even the corporate tax rate, for instance. Joe Manchin, that swing vote senator, he wants 25 percent or no higher than 25 percent for the corporate tax rate. Of course, Biden is proposing 28 percent. So we'll see. I think, you know, they wanted progress by Memorial Day, gee, what, like, what does progress mean? You know, we, don't, well, we don't really know. It's eye of the beholder. And, and especially as a lot of the messages are getting increasingly confused and pointing, for example, at the idea that a number of states have rolled back some of the enhanced unemployment benefits to get more people to drive them into the workforce to actually go work and get, uh, get paid rather than sit home and deal with whatever they have to do and receive a check. I'm wondering how much this stymies some of the Democratic message that this was sort of a template for what people should be seeing with respect to a safety net. I mean, is there any pushback on that front? I, I think so. You know, we're, we're I, it's clear that Democrats in Congress don't all want a revolution that some of the party's progressive wing want. We're starting, starting to see that come through. Remember, it's not just one bill, it's two bills that Biden is trying to push through. The third one, the Americans, fa American Families Plan. Uh, sources have told us that that is what the one they view as the long shot, the least likely of passing you know, in any form, but certainly in, in its entirety. So, you know, we're going to sort of watch how that goes. Remember, the backdrop to this is this was all sort of framed as reaction to the virus. And, you know, we're, we're all moving past it, it seems, in the U.S., but the numbers really are moving down. We have not had mm -hmm. a day with more than 30,000 cases this week in the U.S. That has not happened since mm -hmm. the start of the pandemic. It's remarkable. People are losing sight of that, I think. Josh Wingrove, one more question. Where's the vice president to fit in? Well, give, give us the post-100 days, day-to-day -day rhythm of the vice president with this administration. Well, I believe she'll be meeting as well with the South Korean president. So, you know, she's, she's, she's in the room. Biden wants her to be in the room. She got the deal that Biden got from Obama, which is getting to be the last person. Of course, he's given her uh, either uh, the excitement of a file or the burden of a file, depending on your perspective, to manage that border issue. So that remain, well, that one remains on her plate. But yeah, we'll 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 hear from her hear from her more today. Of course, she did speak yesterday as well with with President Biden when he signed that COVID nineteen hate crimes act. That was a big moment for Democrats and the first time we've seen a full maskless East Room in the Biden White House. It's been months in mm. that. Yeah. So I. I, I felt a little nervous watching it, you know, but I, I, I assume everyone's back. So I just spoke to the control ready. room, Josh. Emily's going to have the week off next week in the six oh, o'clock hour, which wonderful. is good news. And you're going to replace her. <laughs> Did I paint myself into a corner or you what? You're going to replace her. So we'll see Perfect. you at 6.20 on Monday, <laughs> Wake up Tuesday four ten, and Wednesday. Wonderful. And maybe on one day, the early edition of Bloomberg Surveillance might want a word with you too, Josh. Yeah. Right. That's at 5 right. Eastern time. All right. Hey, Josh, My it's great pleasure. to catch up. Thank Happy you, mate. Happy to help. Good Happy to see to you. As always, Bloomberg White House correspondent Josh Wingrove there. Your record market up a third of 1% on the S&P. A little bit data out a little bit later, Tom. Can we call this a summer Friday? Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I am comfortable with that. But what I really see it is as a recovery Friday. What I noticed on the streets, John, Wednesday and Thursday, is a decidedly different New York. I think all of our viewers and listeners are feeling that. We certainly hear that from Mr. Paulson out in Minneapolis. But, John, to me, it's almost, it, yeah, it's a summer thing. But to me, it's a recovery thing. I'm told the weather in London is absolutely brutal, Lisa, and we had hail this week. So I'm not sure they'll be calling this a summer Friday. No, they won't. You'll be, you'll be getting hate mail. Nice that you're sitting pretty in New York City while we deal with a hailstorm. Everyone is going out to eat, though. You're getting going a out tan. to eat? Getting a tan. Nice yeah. sun. It's hot. Really? I'm going out to eat. Of course I'm going out to eat. Yeah?
Do you yes. go out to eat every night to make up for the past I'm 14 months? I'm having three dinners just to wind up Chairman Powell. <laughs> From Good. New York Have City fun. alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovich, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity markets up a third of 1% on the S&P. Yields unchanged at 162.50. Heard on Bloomberg Radio, seen on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. From New York City on TV and radio, here's the price action. Shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Advancing 16 points, up four-tenths of 1%. On the Nasdaq, up about four-tenths. On the Russell, up. by six-tenths of 1%. You want to call this a melt-up, It's a melt-up. It's a melt-up. I'm looking up. for okay. some excitement. We can call it a melt-up. My question of the morning, when is the story fully priced? Macy's out early this week with nice numbers, a nice forward look. Stock was negative. Cisco out with numbers, warning about maybe profitability getting hit because of the supply chain story. Stock finished the day positive. Get your head around that for a little bit. Switch up the board. In the bond market, we look like this on twos, tens and thirties. We don't because I did something else. Here's a chart. That's nice. I like that chart. <laughs> on radio, chart. that was the hype. Can I be clear? <laughs> That's my fault and not the control rooms. Here's a chart of the European Surprise Index, Tom. John, it's never the control room's fault. It's always my fault. I know that. I just want to make sure the audience knows that this one really is my fault. The European Surprise Index, put this one up here because <laughs> it's moving up and to the right in a big way. It's a really, really decent upside surprise again this morning on the PMIs. But we've been waiting for this, haven't we? For Europe to start outperforming. <clears throat> and here it is. The PMIs are great. And this is what the FX market did, which goes back to my question. When is the story fully priced? There was a plan here. Switch at the board and get to the FX market. Euro dollar better be here. There it is. One twenty. Nailed it. Two twenty. Like a Swiss watch. I had a plan. I'm executing it clearly. Really well. <laughs> really. Euro dollar <laughs> negative about a tenth of one percent, even with the better than expected yeah. economic I data. I like how you were jawboning at the screen. It better be there. <laughs> this your, better your be the euro was, dollar. I was talking to myself. <laughs> having a word with myself, Lisa. His other properties will be smoother this morning. It's a summer Friday. Mm -hmm. Give we're me a all break. We're there. You've got a break. I want to get to the weekend. It's like Am I done? Week. Are we done? I need to run away from Are this. You done? <laughs> You are so sure. done. I'm pretty sure I'm done. John Farrell, thank you so much. I was done about the... 45 and, and, seconds and ago. Seriously, folks, and you're, for those getting into the weekend, as John mentions, with the year up doing better, it's the rate of change. It's all happened uh, rather uh, suddenly. Romain Bostic, I believe, is in the house, and maybe he'll be smoother well, uh, in his report. Uh, I'll, I'll try my Mr. best. <laughs> you, you ask a lot of me here, but we take a look at some of the <clears throat> movers here in pre-market. We're going to start off with Deer here, Good. of course. This stock having a phenomenal year. This is the best start to the year uh, for Deer. Uh, uh, in about three decades here. The share is already up more than 30% on a year-to-date basis, up another percentage point here in the pre-market. They came out with earnings, but more importantly, that forecast, that guidance that they gave going forward, well above street estimates. And I'm talking about guidance on net income. I'm talking about guidance on a gap net income basis here. The company really benefiting from that increase in crop prices, also benefiting uh, really strongly here uh, from a big boost here in the export market. Keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on what's been going on in the EV space as well. It's been kind of a topsy-turvy week. Lord Sound Motors took a Remain. ride down 5% here today. Yeah. They were actually down 15% yesterday on a brutal <clears throat> downgrade over at Wolf Research. Yeah. So not only downgrading the stock, but saying its new price target is now $1. A lot of that is because of what people are looking at with regards to Ford. Remember, Ford has been very aggressive over the past couple of months in rolling out their EV strategy. Analysts yeah. are very bullish on this, and they're saying the real kicker here with Ford is the way that they're pricing Ford F-150, yeah. the electric version, and some of these other electric vehicles, they make it very competitive, and it's going to be really hard for some of these also ran companies to sort of keep up here. Remember Ford also uh, coming up uh, next week at the end of next week has a big investor day where they're supposed to lay out a little bit more clarity on the number of models here. So that's going to put a lot of pressure on some of these companies uh, like Lord Sound and some of the others that I guess aren't yeah. named Tesla. Tesla well, actually having a good remaining, yeah. This is all great but the lead indicator for the Midwest and our cyclical boom is the Detroit Tigers. They're on fire. <laughs> is that it? Are yeah, they? They're on fire. Okay, I haven't kept up with the Detroit Tigers. They're on right? fire. I'll break up the Tigers. Break up the Tigers. All right, flip up the board. Here are a couple other things for you, Tom, uh, that you might want to break up here. Facebook, actually now, interesting note out over by Goldman Strategist, saying this is now one of the top picks by hedge funds. About 27% of the hedge funds that they track now own Facebook. Not only that, but they said about 57% of those funds have this as a top 10 holding with regards to weighting. They're actually saying it's Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, and, and Microsoft basically have now become the largest holdings here. So they're actually signaling a sort 
sort of a rotation back into some of these big cap tech names. They're saying some of the cyclical names still rank pretty high, but a lot of these hedge funds have gravitated back to big tech. Keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on McDonald's. It's unchanged here in the pre-market, but there was an interesting lawsuit uh, that came out last night. Byron Allen, of course, a big media mogul, uh, has sued uh, McDonald's. It's kind of a complicated lawsuit, but it has to do with allegations of racial discrimination over advertising. Of course, Byron mm -hmm. Allen owns a ton of media properties, most famously the Weather Channel. I bring it up, too, because Byron Allen is actually going to be a part of the Business Week, a live event later today, so he'll actually be interviewed there. Uh, you should register for that uh, for any viewers out there who haven't checked out. And Decker's Outdoors uh, having a phenomenal quarter. Uh, Tom, this is the maker of Uggs. I know you're a big fan there. Those shares up 7.5% here in the pre-market. <laughs> Romain Bostic, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly. Don't let that pass that. by. Yeah, Romain, just, thank you. Know, you. He Do you wear Uggs? Me there. Do you wear Uggs, TK? Huh, he does. Do you uh, wear Uggs, too? Warm. No, I buy When he drives Uggs. his tractors. Like, like, like in Uggs to his deck. through the house. Let's do this. We have tried as <laughs> all we can shit. today to avoid the inflation debate. We decided we should get somebody qualified to talk about the inflation debate. As John and Lisa mentioned, it's front and center across America in economics, finance, investment. Ed Saini is out of the Math Economics Combine in Hamilton, New York, Colgate University, with Parchman from Harvard as well. He's with Columbia Threadneedle and joins us uh, this morning. Ed, I love, love, love in your note, you speak of inflation dynamics, which is a real mature idea of speaking of the complexities forward. Everybody's talking simplistically about inflation. Tell us the complexity of inflation dynamics as you look to the end of the year. Yeah, so uh, so thanks again. Uh, you know, I think you can kind of split inflation into two big stories. One is psychology, the other one is power. The psychology you know, really kind of connects to the expectations component. It's what the Fed is trying to drive over the medium term. Um, our expectations are a little bit too low versus the Fed's 2% target. The power aspect is the dynamics in the labor market, the dynamics in supply markets right now, where things are just not connecting. Uh, we have significant, significant frictions uh, across those markets, and those frictions will take some time to resolve. And I think there's, there, there's a debate to be had in terms of how long those frictions will take to, um, uh, to resolve. But in the background, we have the Fed essentially targeting not inflation at the moment, but the price level. Uh, they, they've, they've put a temporary price level target for us to make up for some of the inflation shortfalls in the past. We're in this weird zone where the Fed's looking really at, um, at the price level. The rest of the market is really looking at, uh, at short-term rates of inflation, and there's a big disconnect there. And is that just a disconnect between a policymaker that focuses on the destination and a market participant that's looking at the path? Uh, I, I think it's I think it's basically that I think it's basically that there is on the margin uh, an element of doubt, which is, look, essentially, we have a very poor understanding of how inflation is formed. Uh, we've had the comfort of looking at inflation that's been relatively flat below 2 percent for the past 25 years. Um, and we've really anchored around that phenomenon. If that phenomenon starts to change, uh, there is this element of doubt around when will we know if it's changing and will the Fed have the, uh, the toolkit and the right timeline to respond to that change? Uh, and that's where I think a lot of the anxiety is in markets at the moment. So, Ed, you've teed that up perfectly. When will we know? How will we know? Well, look, I think uh, the timeline that the Fed has painted for us um, in, in various shades of gray at the moment is really one in which we achieve inflation in excess of 2.5%, roughly, on a core PCE basis, in the in the first half of next year and then if that persists into the second half of next year and sort of the various flavors of um uh, of inflation expectations uh remain elevated i think the fed will start getting comfortable uh with the fact that inflation dynamics have have, have shifted um underneath that is a core question which is really around wages um i think it's it's an incomplete story if we look at inflation in isolation without looking at at wage growth and so unless you have nominal wage growth pick up, unless you have it sustained at levels where it can potentially feed back into inflation, um, the picture is still incomplete. So we have a long, to, a long way to go. 
It's an incomplete picture. One picture that we do have, though, is the degree to which markets broadly, stocks and bonds, are leveraged to Fed policy. The idea here that even a talking about talking about maybe talking about tapering caused an increase in real yields uh, pretty much automatically. Could the Fed really ever raise rates or is it going to be too disruptive to the economy for them to do so? That's a really good question. I think, you know, mentally we're all kind of anchored off of the 2013 experience, uh, including the Fed. Um, I think a replay of that experience when rates went up, you know, 100 plus basis points in both nominal and real terms across the curve, uh, we don't want a replay of that experience. That's, that's a very sudden tightening of financial conditions. Um, so the Fed strategy at the moment is really focused on ambiguity. Um, they've given themselves a lot of room uh, to start the discussion, to outline the parameters of that discussion and then eventually taper. Um, and the idea is as the market internalizes that and look, the timeline for the Fed, uh, I think is, is relatively well chewed through. The market believes that the Fed will essentially start the taper conversation in August or September, announce it at the, towards the end of the year and then start tapering um, at the beginning of, of, of next year. We've kind of, uh, you know, internalized that quite well, and that gives the Fed an advantage in that they can delay. There is absolutely no pressure on the Fed to actually pull the trigger on this discussion in, in, in August or September. Not right now. Ed, thank you, sir. It's good to get your thoughts on the matter. Thank you very much. Ed Hal Hosseini there, the Columbia Threadneedle global race strategist. In the market right now, in the bond market, yields unchanged, Tom, just south of 163 on tens on a 30-year at about... 234, call it 233, and in the equity market up four tenths of one percent on the S&P to 41.72. Well, it's a quiet week. You need quiet weeks. Of course, that's where you build up the worries. You reframe. To, you have what, what Luis Yamada calls distribution, the back and forth, till you get to the news. I look out at the news next week. We've got home sales. I think, John, that's going to be a booming market uh, as well. Uh, you know, you move on from there to durable goods, things like uh, that. But more than anything, you're going to get personal consumption and a new look at uh, GDP, a second look at GDP. We'll take another look at the banks on Wall Street very shortly. We'll be catching up with Mike Mayo, the Wells Fargo head of U.S. large cap bank research. Looking forward to that after the rejig we saw at J.P. Morgan, which I have to say this Friday feels like it took place a month ago. And Morgan Stanley, the rejig there in the C-suite, that took place yesterday. Before we get there, here's the price action shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Your equity market is elevated, a lift of 17 Melt points. Up. I was waiting for that. Up four tenths of 1% on the S&P. Go to cash, 162.67 on 10. One more time, what was Euro that? Dollar, 122 40. <laughs> Summer uh, Friday. OTI, 62.96. I'll get serious. <laughs> on TV and radio. <laughs> on another property. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Not this one. <laughs> that was so close to home. That's so true. Tom Keane, Lisa Brambis, Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. President Biden says the U.S. will help Gaza with humanitarian aid in the wake of the 11-day conflict with Israeli forces. The ceasefire brokered by Egypt took effect early today. Israeli warplanes and artillery pounded Gaza, whilst Hamas militants fired rockets at Israel. At least 232 Palestinians were killed. 12 people were killed in Israel. In the UK, the number of cases of a coronavirus variant first identified in India more than doubled for a second week. More than 3,400 cases of the variant have now been detected. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says it could affect plans to reopen the rest of the economy from lockdown on June the 21st. And negotiations over President Biden's $2.2 trillion infrastructure plan are hearing a crucial stage. A White House team resumes talks with Senate Republicans today. One Republican tells the Associated Press that they have increased their offer and are working in good faith. The White House had set a soft Memorial Day deadline to decide whether a deal with the Republicans is in fact possible. Tesla CEO Elon Musk may have set his sights on Russia. In a virtual conference today, Musk said Russia is amongst the countries where the electric car maker potentially could build a factory. He also said there should be more dialogue between Russia and the U.S. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
key focus is on whether and how a CBDC could improve on, improve on an already safe, effective, dynamic, and efficient U.S. domestic payment system. We think it is important that any potential CBDC would serve as a complement to, and not a replacement of, cash and current private sector digital forms of the dollar, such as deposits at commercial banks. That was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, there on a digital currency in America. From New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's the price action, cross Malt asset. Up. Equity futures up four tenths of one percent. Is Malt up the drinking word of the day? Mm -hmm. Equities <laughs> up 18 the orange points juice has in it. on the S&P. Uh, Yields orange unchanged juice. at 162. Oh, right. 67 spiked juice. Yeah. The FX market euro dollar 122.14. We're negative about a tenth of one percent. Let's sit on the euro just for a moment, Tom. President Lagarde speaking should, yeah. in the last couple of minutes. She's talking about inflation rises due to the temporary nature of things in 2021. Oh, should on. see through a period of higher inflation. Inflation fundamentals are not there. The recovery remains uncertain. Okay. This is different. We got to stop the show here. With David, what David Wilson has is important. We got to get to it. But John, it's a jumble of headlines. We would not have heard this from Dr. Draghi. So I want to be very careful with our interpretation. These are yeah. headlines that we've taken from her comments, and I think you need to hear her comments from fair, her fair. to get the appropriate context. But there has been some criticism of the ECB president and the communication over several news conferences more recently, Tom, and the lack of clarity around things like the asset purchase program. Coordinated policies will continue to be needed? That sounds like a surveillance headline. Well, we need some coordinated policies <laughs> yeah. for this show. <laughs> we'll discuss that after John, the show. John, seriously, when's the ECB meeting? I've June lost 10th. track of that. June 10th. June 10th. Okay, well, we'll get more there. Futures up 17. They advance through the morning. This is really, really important. David Wilson parachutes in. We never have a clue what he's talking about. Yeah. And I am in the David Wilson timeout chair because, John, I did a big no-no. I just extrapolated the trend off the 2018 lousy bear market. And we hit S&P 5,000 out at the end of next year. David Wilson here on the earnings drive to get to S&P 5,000. Extrapolation's dangerous. It, it always is. But, you know, where we are now is definitely different than where we've been in the past 40 years. But something's changed. Exactly. When you look at yields relative to inflation, real yields, that's really? the issue. Absolutely. Now you're promoting Pharaoh's show? I'm simply stating what the folks at Crestcat Capital were pointing out in their latest well, monthly investor letter. You know, among other things, looking at the earnings yield on the S&P 500, and bear in mind, it's the inverse of the price-earnings ratio. So if you figure, you know, S&P 500 PE of 30 works out to an earnings yield of about 3.3%. That's just about where it is at the moment, touch higher than that 3.4. Compare that with U.S. consumer prices up 4.2%. In the 12 months ended in April. So you know, when you put that all together, you're talking about a yield of minus eight tenths of a percent. You have to go all the way back to December 1980 when Paul Volcker was trying to bring down inflation to see a yield that negative. What does it signal? Can we extrapolate forward and make a guesstimate of what it means? Well, it's a concern for the folks at Crestcat. It's basically telling them that stocks are looking pretty expensive at this point. You know, if you're paying negative yields, in essence, or getting them. I mean, just bear in mind, bond market's been all about negative yields in much of the world for well, quite a while, that's, and that's been the concern. So now you're seeing it show up in a sort of different way in stocks. Dave, this is exactly where I was going to go. It's uh, negative real yields all over the this. place. Well, I mean, honestly, it raises a question <clears throat> about the amount of liquidity that's been pumped into the system. And as I do on Thursdays at 4.30 p.m., the Federal Reserve releases their balance sheet total. And it's a new record high of $7.9 trillion. There are some proposals She's out there from nerd. Deutsche Bank. I am such a nerd, and I embrace that. <clears throat> Um, you know, there is this expectation that despite taper talk, the balance sheet will continue to expand going forward. Can real earnings yields go even more negative given the incredible amount of liquidity both from the Federal Reserve balance sheet as well as from fiscal spending? Well, there's always that potential, no question. You know, you look back to the 70s and into the early 80s, and, and you see yields that are even more negative than we have now. Nonetheless, the idea that this is a change, it really just happened in April, you know, Crestcat looking at monthly data, you, you have to at least ask the question, you know, uh, are stocks looking expensive here? They're certainly asking is, it. Is Pharaoh still with us? I am. <laughs> 
We're not sure. John, are you still with us? <laughs> yeah, well, you worried you'd it, lost it, me. It's piled on gloom here. I mean, it's the pendulum of Wilsonian gloom. Are we calling it that? It's Wilsonian, Wilsonian gloom. gloom. I mean, Lisa picked right up on it. She was the high point of her day. Oh, well, we got gloomy. <laughs> you you realize when seriously. you were away on Monday, Lisa was bulled up. Okay, let me just be really clear. It's not that I'm gloomy. It's just that I'm trying to understand okay. what's not priced in, if you will, <laughs> looking <laughs> around corners, trying to see around them, John. But, but David, okay, what does that mean if we're in a bull market? It's what's not, not being gloomy, priced in? What's, and it's constantly things to the downside, seemingly. <clears throat> well, not necessarily, because we heard okay. earlier uh, from Greg Draco that there could potentially be an upside surprise Some with the amount of... Risk, Lisa. With, yes, upside Some risk. Yes, upside risk. I mean, that goes to inflation, and then there's, of course, the oh, downside of course, there risk. We, there we go. So the, the, <laughs> the only upside risk that Lisa wants to talk about, TK, <laughs> is inflation. Upside risk on inflation. No, in, in terms of spending. But spending, okay, yes. cool. David Wilson, right. go away. Let's <laughs> go on Friday. That was I'm way too much it. math on Friday. Simple no. subtraction, Tom. That's all it is. Simple subtraction. <laughs> Very good. David Wilson, thank you uh, so much. John, I'm, I'm ser seriously, there's a bid to the market. I know it's not much of a percentage move, uh, half a percent on S no, excuse me, four-tenths of a percent on the Standard & Poor's 500. But I'm sorry, John, there's a... There's a nudge. There's a nudge. A nudge this morning. President nudge. Lagarde out with some more headlines, Tom. The ECB Please. committed to preserving favourable conditions must provide support well into the recovery. Italy in mind here with the 10-year yield in Italy back through 1% <clears> over the last couple of weeks. And I think that's the focus going into June 10th for the ECB meeting and that news conference with President Lagarde. Well, yeah, well into the recovery is the thing. I mean, in, in the ECB's defence, John, they've been a little clearer about extending their timeline out clearly. I think they've done a much better job than the Fed of, say, in 2022 and even yeah, 2023. Yeah, the, the, the time-contingent guidance is sometimes helpful, but oh, it's, un, it's, un, it's unhelpful, call Tom. That? It's time-contingent forward guidance. Oh, thank you. Instead of state-contingent forward guidance. Yeah, that's guidance, like another trip to Brandy be, Melville, but we won't go there. Let's pick a spot in the data and say when we get there, we'll do something. Guidance. Are we done? Right, we're so done. Time-contingent sure. <laughs> guidance. Okay, you know that anyway. I do? Yes, you do. <clears throat> okay. Um, I, you know, I'm looking at the bond market, John. You know, can I say curve flatter? We haven't talked about it in ages, but there's some really seriously, there's some really serious, interesting fixed income. It stopped steepening. Right I think you can say that. And real yields yeah. were the move of the week. Real yields yeah. were higher. Well, it's a show of the week, so you know it dovetails out. It's time, it folks, to tell you about the real yield. 1 p.m. this afternoon. Seriously, folks, this will be something to get you ready for the weekend with a fixed income market coming out. The publications tonight. I can't wait. Just as an example, to see Mike Faroli publish over at J.P. Morgan this evening to see that view because there's a lot of shifting going out there, and it's displayed a nominal yield, less the inflation adjustment, which gets you out to the residual. <laughs> We're calling it the residual. Okay. Tom Keane. <laughs> that was going to be the name of my new property. Jonathan Ferris. The residual. The residual. Your equity market up four tenths of one percent on the S&P. We advance 18 <clears throat> points. Doing my best to keep this on the rails. A couple more hours. In fact, I've got 45 minutes left with you. This is Bloomberg. All this money sloshing around, these incredibly low interest rates, I think we risk an inflation surge. If the economy stays as strong as it is, fueled by all of the stimulus that was put behind it, you get inflation. Economists and everyone, companies are having a really difficult time keeping up with how fast fundamentals are improving. What we're seeing in the U.S. is just a, a very rapid uh, rebound in demand uh, and supply is taking a little bit of time to adjust. We see a, a decent amount of risk that inflation could keep rising. It's already rising, but stay higher for longer. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Brownson, and Tom Keene. It is a simulcast on this Friday, set for the weekend with interesting markets uh, as well. Futures up, well, futures up 18. The VIX 20.37, some good news there. And then all of the data in this odd, odd week with the, with, we've seen, John, the inflation debate, it just struggles forward. I thought it was a clumsy debate this week. You'll see it again at 9.45 Eastern time when we get the PMIs in America and there'll be a focus <clears> on the output and a focus on prices paid as well. But the top line, the headline number, still in the 60s. That's terrific. And it's set to continue, Tom. 
There's a lot of demand in this economy, and the demand supply mismatch has been the story, and it continues to be the story, with inflation at the epicenter of that debate. Yeah, the epicenter of the debate, as David Wilson just talked about with the S&P ratio and all that, I really didn't understand what he's talking about. I'll <laughs> let you translate it <laughs> afterwards. But, John, you know, what I would go to, John, that I think is so important is Greg Dako opening up surveillance this morning yeah. and making very clear Oxford's optimistic view. Those are numbers that are not in the market right now. Well, Lisa brought up a good question. It's what happens with a savings rate. And I do think that's important later this year. It's very, very elevated. <clears throat> a lot of money has been accumulated yeah. over the last 12 months, money that could have been spent, that was not spent, that will be spent, the degree to which it will be spent and how much will be over the next few months. I think it's important for what these numbers look like. I do agree. It's the heart of the matter, all the cash that's out there in different guises. But Lisa, the idea that, I mean, I get that we'll consume it and all that, but to me, the idea idea that ultra-conservative money is somehow going to move into Apple shares, I just can't get there. Well, there's a question of the disposable income that people actually have versus what's considered wealth. That was sort of what Greg Dako was talking about. To your point about Dave Wilson's chart, I think there is an important point here that, frankly, to me, was one of the biggest takeaways of the week, which is pricing power. Which companies have the ability to raise prices, pass <clears throat> along the increase in input costs to their consumers, and which don't and are seeing deeper negative real yields as they pay higher prices? And to me, that seems like an increasing distinction within markets, Tom. Yeah, John, what we're long in in London is shovels. Hell in May, John, would you yeah. explain the weather in London? The weather has been absolutely abysmal in London, just as the UK's reopening. More rain, I think, over the next week as well. I've been exchanging a photo of the weather app on my Apple iPhone with my family, Tom, just taking a snapshot of what the week ahead looks like in New York and what well, it looks like in London, and it's not pretty. Yeah, Mike Bell coming up here with a bonkers hailstorm. We'll talk about that in a moment. John, let's walk through the data here right now before we get into good conversation. John, I'm going to look at a sustained equity lift. Not a big percentage move, but off of the melt-up two days ago and then the good action yesterday it continues this morning. Futures up 18. Up four tenths of 1% on the S&P and taking a small bite out of a <coughs> weekly loss so far on the S&P 500. More broadly in the bond market, looking at yields not doing much this morning at 162.33, basically where they started the week. And I will say also the average since the start of April is basically where we are too on a US 10-year at 162. It's what's happening beneath the surface of the nominal yield yeah. that you need to pay attention <coughs> to, Tom. Real yields coming in this week, coming in. And I know we're still negative about 80 basis points, but it's worth a look. Yeah, well, right now, let's bring in Mike Bell in London with J.P. Morgan Asset Management. And, of course, the hailstorm is, is one of the media there said it was a bonkers hailstorm. Mike Bell, give us the hailstorm, the uncertainty, if you will, of emerging markets. They have not been something we focused on. They have been removed. Is emerging markets, as a broad sense, an opportunity forward or not? I think it's probably actually the biggest opportunity over the next decade that we see. I mean, we think that China, for example, is going to grow at about 4.5% per annum annualized over the next decade, which means it'll, its economy is going to be about 50% larger in 10 years' time than it is today. So to put that into some perspective, you're talking about ballpark a $7 trillion increase in annual consumption by 2030, which is larger than the UK and German economies combined. Um, and then you've got India, it's going to grow faster, but from a slower, a lower base. We think it'll grow at nearly 7% a year over the next decade, which means the economy should roughly double in that period. Um, obviously, there's a lot of difficulty going on in India with COVID at the moment, but we think that by the end of the year, they will have vaccinated yeah. around 60% of the population. And so John, we're, we're bullish. And John, this is like a foreign conversation to us. We've been so focused on transatlantic and the pandemic and all that, we forgot to reset on Asia economic growth. Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater mentioned that a bit earlier. And Mike, the uncorrelated asset of the year for some people has been the Chinese bond market. Is that something you're looking at too? Yeah, we think that's attractive. Obviously, there's a limit to how much uh, people outside of Asia are realistically going to put into Chinese bonds. But uh, nevertheless, I do think that when you look around the world, it's one of the few developed mar or one of the few uh, bond markets that really uh, offers an attractive yield at the moment. So it's certainly something that uh, can be used for diversification purposes. 
Mike, there's, there's China and there's India and then there's everyone else in the emerging markets. And I do wonder about some of these studies that are coming out of the World Bank and other organizations talking about the great divergence, the fact that the recessions have been brutal and are affecting the middle classes in a lot of these nations way more than, for example, the U.S., the Eurozone and China. How do you parse out this distinction within the emerging markets between the haves and the have nots and the maybe have nots for an even longer time post pandemic? Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, our preference at the moment is for Asia. If you think about MSCI EM, uh, China, India, Korea, and Taiwan are about 75% of the index. So we're pretty favorable on the outlook for those four countries. But in some of the other parts of emer the emerging world, where, as you say, it's going to take them longer to get the vaccine uh, fully rolled out, we've got uh, higher concerns. You know, Mike Bell, I look at this. I was talking to Brad from Brisbane this morning, well, somebody who watches the show every day. And Mike Bell, the, to me, too. it's a lot of micro stories, and it can be on the vaccine and the serious nature of it, the distribution of the vaccine in Indonesia, what the World Bank's going to do, what the IMF is going to do, and all that. And then there's, on the complete other end of it, People saying we're going to deploy. J.P. Morgan is going to deploy into Hong Kong. If you want to give us news on that, we're taking notes. But I look at, like, Hermes opening in Brisbane, Australia, or reimagining it, whatever that means. I mean, that's a huge deal. All these micro stories from Australia on up to Japan. Yeah, ultimately, I think, like, businesses are going to take the long-term view. And the long-term story is that rising incomes in Asia is going to be the key source of growth over the next 10, 20 years. Uh, so I think that's why you're seeing lots of businesses pivoting towards Asia, and I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Mike, where's the European trade fit into all of this? A lot of people getting long Europe recently on the idea the data improves, but the price action's been there. It's been positive in European equities all year. Yeah, I mean, Europe's benefiting, obviously, from the fact that you're getting this booming global uh, goods trade, uh, which Europe benefits from. Uh, the domestic economy is obviously lagging because they've been a bit slower to roll out the vaccine. But nevertheless, if you look at the daily pace of vaccinations in Europe now, it's actually caught up to the UK. So I think you're going to see in the third quarter pick up in the domestic economy as well. So I think European equities will move higher. Um, whether they outperform something like the U.S., I personally have a preference for, say, U.S. financials to European financials, but I still think that European equities will go higher. What about the other large caps within the United States? Are you seeing opportunities there, or do you think that most of the gains there have been had? Yeah, look, ultimately, I think if you look at S&P 500, for example, 12-month uh, forward earnings in 18 months' time should be about 15% higher than where they are now. So the question is, to what extent do valuations come down to offset that? For the most expensive stocks, it's possible that they come down and offset that. But we're seeing plenty of reasonably valued companies in the US where we think you can see returns in the regional, as I say, uh, 10 to 15% over the next 18 months without too much difficulty. Now, as bond yields go higher, we think we're going to see 10-year yields head up to around 2%. That tends to favor things like the financials and may weigh on the valuations of some of the larger tech stocks. So we've got a value bias within the U.S. Mike, got to leave it there. Mike Bell, J.P. Morgan, Asset Management Global Market Strategist over in Europe, in London. The weather, terrible. T.K., where did Brisbane come, stuff come from? What's that about? I, it, to me, it's a micro strategy. I, I mean, I think, John, this is okay. so important. You got guys like Mike Bell, which are at 60,000 feet and all that. You know, you, and, and you got the low end, the high end, yeah. the middle. I learned this years ago. There was a point, John, years ago where EM was owned concrete stocks and telephone stocks. That was the whole strategy. And some really brave people, including Mark Mobius, changed that view to going to micro stories that are there. It just happens Brisbane and Hermes was there, but it could have been something else in Vietnam. Well, the index, the MSI index, is now heavily weighted towards tech and Asian tech for emerging markets. TK, you ever been to Brisbane? No, I, you know, I've been, I was supposed to go like four times. It's really, the, it's John, cool. this is true. You're in Singapore. And you go, okay, we want you to go to Sydney and meet some people. And then they go, it's just so far to get there and then to get back to New York. I've never been. You should just go up to Brisbane, South Bank. There's this fake beach. I think it was called Streets Beach or something like that. Your kind of vibe, Tom. I don't know. The Veronica's wanted me to come down there, but I just couldn't get You'd there. You'd have a great time. Yeah. Then you know. go to the Gold Coast. <laughs> 
go to the beaches. I'm trying to see around corners of this paradise. show. I can't. What's going on? It's Friday, <laughs> Lisa. It's guys, Friday, Lisa. You're doing uh, what? I trip there. planning? I lived there for a little bit. You did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where haven't you lived? Seriously. You've done a, nice, a tour of the United States? I had a nice time in Brisbane. What were you doing there? Back, just looking around at the Aussie dollar. Thinking about the future, looking around corners. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that you had some time looking around corners. Coming Fun. up, Mike Mayo, Wells Fargo head of US large cap bank <laughs> research from New York City this morning. Your price action looks like this. Can you play the music, guys? Just play it early. <laughs> Equities up 16 on the S&P, up four tenths of one percent. In your bond market unchanged, yields 162.50. Euro dollar 121.82. Yeah. We roll over here, TK. John. The euro weaker down cash. four tenths. John, this is important. Mohammed in Cambridge says the hail in Cambridge collides. Collides. The weather's been terrible in Cambridge, too. Hello, Mohammed. I'll catch up with Mohammed in about 45 minutes. If you want to tune into Bloomberg The Open. Oh, good. I'll tune <laughs> into that. TV well done. At 9 a.m. No love from Mohammed. Eastern time. We caught up with Mohammed. We talked to him last week. Did we? Yes, together. It becomes a blur. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Palestinians poured into the streets of the Gaza Strip early today to celebrate a ceasefire with Israel. The Hamas militant group and Israeli forces are now observing a truce that ended 11 days of conflict. At least 232 people were killed by Israeli airstrikes and artillery fire on Gaza. A dozen died during Hamas rocket attacks on Israel. The U.S. is now calling for a global minimum corporate tax of at least 15 percent. That's less than the 21 percent rate it has proposed for the overseas earnings of U.S. businesses. Some nations had called that rate, well, excessive. International negotiators are trying to come up with an agreement this summer. The European Union is offering the region's battered tourist industry a chance to salvage the summer. EU negotiators have agreed on the introduction of certificates that will allow quarantine free travel within the bloc. The coronavirus documents will offer proof their holders have been vaccinated, have recovered from the illness or have a recent negative test. And the largest maker of agricultural machinery, Deer, has lifted its profits forecast for the full year. Surging crop prices have boosted consumer demand for new equipment. So has the broader upswing in commodities. Deer posted stronger than expected quarterly earnings. And one of the largest insurance companies in the U.S. paid $40 million in March to hackers after a ransomware attack. Bloomberg learned that CNA Financial paid up about two weeks after a company trove of data was st stolen. That payment was bigger than previously disclosed ransoms. CNN says the company followed the law. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. going to acquire the technology and install it. I think that's the answer. Uh, there are plenty of neobanks and, and uh, um, uh, purely fin fintech banks uh, that will be successful. Uh, but I think the fight is going to be on just getting the technology in place, uh, particularly for the larger banks so that they can compete. Um, and so I guess what I'm telling you is I think the basic banking sector uh, will, will live another day. Robert Albertson there, the Piper Sandler Chief Financial Strategist from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Brambitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Counting you down to the opening bell, one hour and about 12 minutes away. Equity shaping up as follows on the S&P. Positive 16 points. We advance about four-tenths of 1%. A lift here. And a move in the euro, euro dollar negative, just a little bit more so in the last hour, down by a yeah. third of 1%. Did Weaker Lagarde euro, do that? Stronger dollar. Don't know, Tom. Was a gap lower, though? 121. 91. In the bond market, 162.50. Yields unchanged and crude positive by about 1.9%. We add a dollar and about 20 yeah. cents to WTI, 63 and 11 cents. One of our high points of the day to get you recalibrated on global Wall Street and particularly American Wall Street. He is, after saying 200,000 jobs will be jettisoned, truly an exile on Wall Street. Michael Mayo joins us with Wells Fargo from his decades of work, including a dark day with Credit Suisse years ago to now holding court at Wells Fargo, head of U.S. <laughs> large cap bank research. 
Mike Mayo with us. Mike, I've got to rip up the script. This is all anybody's talking about, and you are the one to give perspective. Can a duo run consumer banking? They're going to try that at J.P. Morgan. Is it feasible? I'm never a fan of dual heads. Having said that, J.P. Morgan cultivates a culture of collaboration. So whoever collaborates better is ironically, the one who could ultimately win. Uh, We have two women who are in contention to take Jamie Dimon's job. Having said that, you know when Jamie Dimon retires? N plus five. (laughs) (laughs) Add add five years to whenever you ask him the question. So I don't think it's happening anytime soon. I think the the board wants him to stay. Investors want him to stay. But you do have two women who are in contention. If the two women are in contention, two men in contention, you know, let's be honest, this is absolutely original stuff. To your research note, which stopped Wall Street a few days ago, how will the dominant J.P. Morgan consumer franchise and adapt and adjust to automation, to digital banking and the rest that you highlight? Well, J.P. Morgan is a microcosm of the broader industry. And for you, Tom, I'm going to the classics. I'm going to the Greek philosopher Plato, who said, necessity is the mother of invention. Banks have no choice but to get more efficient, to use automation, and to streamline. So whether it's J.P. Morgan or any other bank, even though they're opening up branches and hiring advisors and all sorts of people, over the next 10 years, we expect headcount to decline by 200,000 jobs, up to 200,000 jobs for the banking industry. And that's because You have automation in the back office, digitization in the front office, and because banks have no choice as they compete against big tech, big retail, and a bunch of non-banks that have a lot less regulation. How is that going to go down politically, Mike? Uh, Not always well, uh, but it can be better than in the past because with natural attrition, banks can try to walk that fine line between becoming a lot more efficient and without destroying their you know, political and regulatory reputations, and also their ESG scores, because everyone's watching, you know, if you fire a lot of people, that hurts your Interesting. Uh, ESG scores. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a tough job. It's a different job to be a bank CEO today. In the past, it was about creating, you know, generating a sustained long-term value. Today, it's doing that and a lot more. You need to be more attuned to issues around climate uh, and social issues. Um, and diversity, and so it's a a bigger challenge. Mike, what does that mean for the physical presence on Main Street? Uh, Well, a lot less branches. You're going to see a lot less branches and a lot less people per branch, and uh, they call it DIY, do-it-yourself, and also more do-it-together services. So you'll see banks, you know, working with customers that show them how to adapt uh, to using more digital tools. And the pandemic turbocharged the tech revolution at banks. You can't force a change in customer behavior, but the pandemic did so, and that played into the banking industry's strategic uh, playbook for the next five to 10 years. Mike, when you talk about competition from a number of different sources, we should also talk about competition from the Federal Reserve itself or from the U.S. government. Uh, The Federal Reserve saying yesterday that they're going to put out a report on the U.S. digital dollar debate this summer that could disintermediate the big banks. How much are you paying attention to this? Well, you, you have to pay attention to this. I mean, there's threats to banks and disintermediation of banking goes back, you know, half a century. And so you first saw that with uh, traditional bank loans getting disintermediated to the the capital markets. And then you've seen that with some of the the fintech players and the payments business. And so you have to watch, you know, anything related to, you know, digital uh, currencies or anything else. Having said that, I think the banking industry's business model resiliency for the largest banks is underappreciated. And a deposit at a large bank is different than a deposit at another bank. It's driven by a hybrid distribution system that's physical and digital. It's driven by multi-products, whether it's a checking account, savings account, credit card, mortgage, investment. So, um, yes, you have to watch this, but the death of banks 
has been greatly exaggerated the last few uh, decades. Mike, perhaps the death of banks, but just quickly here, I'm wondering what you think in terms of mergers and acquisitions. How consolidated could the industry get as they cut what you estimate to be 200,000 jobs? Absolutely, there should be an acceleration in bank mergers. Goliath is winning. The largest banks have scale. The smaller banks need to generate that scale. That was mentioned as the number one reason for the, the biggest recent merger in the last few years, now known as, as Truist. Um, so we wouldn't be surprised to see half the number of banks out there you know, over the next decade. Mike, More just, mergers to come. Just before we run, Mike, a lot has been made of ESG and diversity, and you touched on that yourself in this conversation. You were the one to bring it up. Why do you think that wasn't a big part of the consideration for Morgan Stanley's shake-up? Look, ultimately, um, you know, the ability of managers uh, to, you know, generate the returns, help the firm as a whole, um, and represent the firm, you know, drives these decisions. And so, you know, Jamie Dimon didn't select the two women co-heads of consumer uh, who are likely the next one of those or the next successor because they're women. It's because they're, they're the most capable. So yeah. I think the chips fall where they will. Well said, Mike. Thank you. Mike Mayo, Wells Fargo head of U.S. large cap bank research on the situation on Wall Street and a management rejig that we've seen so far this week. From New York City this morning, good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. In your equity market, shaping up as follows. 41.70 on the S&P. We advanced 16 points, up four-tenths of 1%. Some PMI data coming in about one hour and 20 minutes stateside. Before we get there, more still to come. We'll be catching up with Terry Haynes, Pangea policy founder, on a situation down in Washington, D.C. It's gone a bit quiet on the infrastructure front. We're up four-tenths of 1% on radio, on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. minutes from the opening bell in New York City. Good morning to you. Alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market shaping up as follows. Up 16. We advance by four tenths of 1% on the S&P. Your bond market just south of 162 on 10. Some headlines crossed in the Bloomberg. The IMF backing a $50 billion plan to help the world escape the COVID crisis and narrow the gap in access to life-saving vaccines that's threatening the global economic recovery from the pandemic. So, Tom, that's the effort right now, calling for a $50 billion yeah. spending plan to narrow that gap. That The IMF <clears throat> out with that story this morning. Part of that is the word proposal, and it is a proposal, and they've got to line up the developed nations. There's some really serious uh, action in there about the percent vaccinated in the United Kingdom and the U.S. Call it all in 50 percent, 5-0. And, John, in Africa, they published 2 percent is the percent of vaccination. That's, to me, the lead uh, quote. But, John, this is a proposal, and they've got to line up America. To fund an ambitious bet of effort, an ambitious effort to immunize at least 40% of the global population by the end of this year, at least a 60% or more by the first half of 2022. The IMF has been talking about this great divergence, the idea that a number of emerging markets have really lagged behind, and you actually see the middle class shrinking. And just to quote the Deputy, Sec Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, this has become the inequality virus the diverging world we're hurtling towards is a catastrophe. Can you get the developed world that is rebounding rapidly to get on board and to help pay for some of these initiatives? Uh, that's unclear. Yeah, agreed. Just to recap then, the IMF calling for a $50 billion spending plan to protect the rest of the world against COVID-19 and narrow the gap in access to life-saving vaccines, Tom. That mm -hmm. headline just crossing. Well, the headline just crossing, and it does fold into what we see in Washington in the markets. John, help me here quickly on the data. I think it is important on a Friday. I see a persistent lift in equities, even though it's not that big a move. Yeah, so. four tenths of one yeah. percent on the S and P. Dollar coming yeah. back just a little bit stronger. And I should point out a little bit later, we'll catch up with the IMF managing director, Christina Gurgeva, a little bit later today, Tom. Terry Haynes joins us now with Pangea Policy, their founder here and a good uh, student of the dynamics of Washington. Terry, there is isolationism in America. America. It's always been there, back to the founders, a certain character, let's say, in the pre-World War II era, all sorts of shades after World War II, a unique Trump isolationism, a sense there. And now with Israel-Gaza, and even with this announcement from the IMF for a cash call, 
a new isolationism in Washington. What does that look like? Uh, Tom, good morning. Uh, what I think it looks like is a essentially a rebalancing of international uh, responsibilities with uh, w with domestic responsibilities. There's a, I think there's a sense, and there's been a sense for about five or six years that, frankly, I think predates Trump, uh, that we've been spending too much time and effort thinking globalism is going to solve all our problems and instead understanding that it's exacerbated a lot, uh, what I'll shorthand as the flyover country problem, and uh, flyover uh, part uh, nation problem. And uh, and uh, we ought to be spending some more time with that. So, you know, we're back to the old wrangle of exactly how much time and effort we ought to be spending on, on domestic priorities as opposed to worrying about the international. And, uh, you know, frankly, that complicates policymaking across the board. Do you ascribe to the tradition that foreign policy doesn't matter when people waltz into the 2022 or 2024 booth? Or does it matter this time around? I think it matters to them always, frankly. There, there are always issues that, uh, that, that differentiate candidates. Uh, and, you know, we, we see a lot of those happening right now. You've already, uh, you've already hit on it with, uh, with part of it with Middle East policy. Uh, China, China policy, of course, is a very big and, you know, frankly, bipartisan initiative at this point. Uh, but anybody that wanted to change China policy at this point would be looked at very skeptically. Uh, you know, the eyeballs on Russia, same thing, uh, just to name three off the top. But, yeah, it does matter to, to, it does matter to voters. Terry, let's jump to June, the president's first big overseas trip, and he's going over to Europe. What do you think the priorities are? Uh, the priorities for them are uh, they, they want to show, firstly, they want to show off uh, that you know, their, their America is back theme, that they, they, they want uh, to show cozy relationships across the board uh, with the European Union, number one. Number two, they actually want to show how they're uh, moving the ball forward, and they're going to have to get past this, uh, uh, this Nord Stream problem and put it into a broader context to show how that decision uh, to waive sanctions there uh, is positive for other aspects of the European uh, project. And third, they want to show a united front against uh, Russia, but more importantly, China. Uh, th that's where they go. They've got a Germany problem, haven't they, with that in mind, Terry? Not so much as a yeah, pan-European very... problem, it's a Germany problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, some wags in Brussels always say if Hitler had understood that all he had to do was to conquer everybody economically, uh, you know, <laughs> as, as Germany has with the, the EU, uh, you know, the, we wouldn't have had the Second World War. But the, uh, the more important part of this is that uh, you've got a new government. You've got more instability in Germany for the first time in a long time. You've got a new government, a new way of looking at things. Uh, some people say a loss of confidence. Uh, so that is, th those are all uh, variables that the administration is going to have to work with to resolve. So it's a higher mountain than it was just a few months ago. Meanwhile, here at home, Terry, one reason why I love reading your reports is because you actually assign probabilities to the likelihood of certain legislative initiatives getting passed. Where are we in terms of the probability of a bipartisan infrastructure bill getting passed in the near term? Well, thank you, Lisa. And, I, and you know, I've been non-consensus, uh, was non-consensus uh, about 60, 65 percent for some time on that. I think that's coming together uh, in a uh, kind of uh, 800 billion to 1 trillion range at the top. There's clearly a desire to want to do something there and uh, on a bipartisan <clears throat> basis. It amounts to a plus up of about 100 percent over what we would be spending on infrastructure anyway. So it's not insignificant, but it would take a, uh, quite a while to roll out. Uh, the bigger question is the, you know, whether or not uh, it's going to be able to roll out faster. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's going to happen. So the, the people won't see and businesses won't see a difference uh, to that uh, very much. And I also think it makes uh, the, the, what the administration calls the families package, uh, which is uh, most of the rest of us call everything else uh, that much uh, harder to get. Uh, Democrats will understand that the last train is going to leave the station. They'll want everything they want in it. Uh, people tend to forget that the Affordable Care Act got passed on reconciliation, but it took something like five months after the House had first passed it to finalize it, and, and that's a positive case. So, you know, the Washington's going to fool around with uh, the families package into the winter and probably, you know, I'd say at least into the winter. What's the likelihood of that getting passed? 
Uh, I, I have that at uh, very much below 50 percent at this point. I'll give you, I'll give you 30 percent. It's alive and kicking, yeah. but, uh, but I don't see the path forward for it right now. Jerry, we had the privilege of speaking to the Republican from Montana yesterday, Steve Daines, and it was a really good conversation. I am uh-huh. fascinated by how you translate the middle ground of American politics is personified by John Tester and Steve Daines in Montana. What's the future of the middle in America if Montana's living it? <laughs> um, you know what? Those are two very smart members. I've had the pleasure to spend uh, a fair amount of time with Senator Tester over the years, and uh, uh, he's a very capable senator. The uh, and and somebody that's really looking out for things. The you know the. The uh, the way people uh, present themselves these days is uh, market themselves in politics is polarized. They'd, they'd say necessarily so, but there's an awful lot of people trying to figure out what the middle ground is and uh, and work on it from there. Uh, we're losing some of those good people, people like Rob Portman and Pat Toomey, uh, but as you point out, people like uh, Tester and Danes are still there, and uh, you know between him, people like uh, Tim Scott, for example. Uh, I think there's a, there's still an awful lot of people in the Congress, particularly in the Senate, uh, that are looking to try to figure out exactly uh, how to deal with the what we'll call the problems of the middle uh, and uh, and improve things. So, you know, I, I remain optimistic about that in the long term. Mm. Terry, good to hear from you, as always. Terry Haynes there, Pangea Policy Founder Great. on the latest down in D.C. and on the divide in this country, <laughs> politically and the Lonely center ground, Tom Keane, that you just touched on. Well, it's a lonely and retiring center ground, uh, center ground as you hear about Ohio and Pennsylvania leadership uh, deciding to exit. We always get that, John, but you really wonder what the retirement path is going to be and the opportunities from retirement, that incentive as well, as we get to 2022 and particularly on to 24. John, in the markets right now, I, I'm looking at a 10-year yield. I mean, the yield is crushed. Down a basis point. <laughs> I mean, relatively speaking, is that how boring the price action's been this uh-huh. morning? No, but, you know, within the yes. tight range we're in, we've come down to a higher price and a lower yield, one to four digits. Should we go to six digits? Let's do it. One. 1.616592. Thank you, Tom. 161.65 on tens. Your equity market up 16. We advance four tenths of 1% on the here, S&P. Jen. Help me. I'm helping you. Yeah. Coming up on the program, on the open. Bloomberg Opinion columnist and Queen's College President Mohammed El Arian, and then with him, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management on Very the week good. that was and the year ahead as well on this bond market with real yields coming back yeah. just a little bit. And both of these guys, both Bob and Mohammed, <clears throat> making the point that maybe you need to taper sooner rather than later. That debate gearing up just a little bit more. Yeah. Very it's bond talk. Well, <laughs> honestly, though, this is actually really a good question. Can they taper? And what does tapering mean if they then start expanding their balance sheet? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was looking at Deutsche Bank's Jim Reed's note yesterday, and he basically said if the balance sheet debt ratio stays at the post great financial crisis level, it'll be at $40 trillion by 2050, John. Tapering isn't tightening. Remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah, I mean, from but 10 years ago, whatever it was, tapering's not tightening. My, my oh, point being, it, they might tighten or taper for, you know, two months, but what does that actually mean in the scheme of things? How much can they remove some of the accommodation? Uh, uh, enough gloom. Can I just is suggest... That gloom? How is with, that gloom? With London, with London hell, the miserable weather, Alarian's living over there. John, it's a gorgeous weekend in New York City. It is. Okay, it's just time for a tang mimosa. Well, this, this evening you it's know. going to be. Yes, yeah, someone wrote in. It's Friday. Can we get TK on a John Deere tractor with a Tang Mimosa coming down Fifth <laughs> no, not Avenue? Not the John Deere tractor. We can the work on that. Bow tie they got, mandatory. They got the orange juice with a pulp. Oh, for I don't like that. <laughs> with that pill. Not sure who this person back. is. But I think we should. I think we should go. So there. I'm going to run, guys. This was fun. Oh, please, as fast Thank as you, you can. <laughs> British sarcasm at its best. <laughs> Had a great week with you both. Looking forward to next week too for more of the same. Equities 41.69. Let me know what happens to Harry Kane. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. <clears throat> Equities up 15 points to the S&P. Heard on Bloomberg Radio, seen on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden says the U.S. will help Gaza with humanitarian aid in the wake of that 11-day conflict with Israeli forces. The ceasefire brokered by Egypt took effect early today. Israeli warplanes and artillery pounded Gaza while Hamas militants fired rockets at Israel. At least 232 Palestinians were killed and 12 people were killed in Israel. Negotiations over President Biden's $2.2 trillion infrastructure package are nearing a crucial stage. A White House team resumes talks with Senate Republicans today. One Republican tells the Associated Press that they have increased their offer and are working in good faith. The White House had set a soft memori Memorial Day deadline to decide whether a deal with the Republicans is possible. And Tesla CEO Elon Musk may have set his sights on Russia. In a virtual conference today, Musk said Russia is amongst the countries where the electric car maker potentially could build a factory. He also said there should be more dialogue between Russia and the U.S. And in Italy, Unicredit has shocked investors by deciding to skip a coupon payment next month on $3.6 billion of bonds. The bank reported a net loss for last year. That's one of the conditions under which it can miss obligations on the bonds. And Apple put its star witness on the stand today in that antitrust trial with Epic Games. CEO Tim Cook is scheduled to be the last person to testify in the courtroom in Oakland, California. He's expected to argue that Apple's rule for its app store ensure a seamless user experience. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. You certainly see everything here just booming again. Traffic, you know, is just something that we haven't seen for a while here that uh, you're, you're dealing with again as people are actually going down to work. The downtown is coming back to life. You know, so I, I, I think companies are starting to reevaluate. The thing that we, we did here is we, we went from a depressionary bust to a wartime boom. <clears throat> Jim Paulson there with Luthal Group, very optimistic on the economy, speaking of the span of the United States of America. Right now, Lisa Bramowitz and I welcome you to, without question, your most important conversation of the day, because it's what we all do as we break bread before the pandemic, in this pandemic, and coming out of the pandemic. There is flat out no one in the restaurant and food business who is committed to optimism more than Daniel Balut. He joins us this morning with an 11,000-foot triumph at Grand Central Station and the new Vanderbilt Tower. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us on Le Pavillon and the success. This is huge, huge optimism. How urgent is it for you to fill every seat starting yesterday? Well, thank you, Tom, for having me, and good morning. Um, of course, it's huge to open a new restaurant, always, for anyone but uh, it is huge in this time because we really feel that we are coming out of the pandemic and it's time to bring the city back together. And I think for me, uh, it's not about how many seats can we feel and all that, but just bring back jobs, bring back hope and, and have the opportunity to create something new and unique. And one Vanderbilt, the project finish on time, finish on budget, Throughout the year, the pandemic, it never. We had slowed down, but we never stopped. And I think that's um, that's something which I'm very proud of to be associated with SL Green and the project there because uh, the project kept on going. When you came to New York, you couldn't get into the fancy restaurants. You were a piddling chef, and nobody wanted to talk to you, anything like that. I know now you pick up the phone and you get my table uh, instantly. What I want to know is, will we change how we eat after this horrific pandemic? Whether the fancy or the less fancy, do you sense that we'll change the way we approach food? I don't think so. I think people want to go back to indulge. People want to go back to be pampered, to be uh, to discover new restaurants, to be able to enjoy the food to the fullest. And of course, we are very conscious, and uh, we have to keep our safety 
uh, as a priority for us, the staff. We keep wearing masks. We try to not make maybe so many dishes who can be shareable. And, uh, and uh, we try to really respect also distance and timings and all that so guests feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. but People are anxious to go out, and uh, I see in my restaurant at Daniel or Barboulou also the terrace is so much in demand now. It's fantastic. Yeah, Chef Boulud, whenever you walk down the street in New York City, you see all of the restaurants absolutely flooded with people looking to get back. There is a question, though, and you are not seeing that in Midtown. In Midtown, it still is a bit of a ghost town as offices still try to bring some workers back and have a questionable time frame. What does the power lunch of the post-pandemic era look like? Well, right now it looks like nothing because there's not that many restaurants open for power lunch. But I think uh, there is definitely a buzz in Midtown. And I see around Grand Central, uh, I see people coming back to the office. And we have people coming out of work and coming to have a drink at the bar at Le Pavillon. But uh, so that means they, be, they must have been working around there. And uh, I think Power Lunch will come back in September, resume when the, all the hotels are open, New York is back. And I think the office will bring back people because they have to. Well, when you talk, uh, Chef Boulud, about the cities that are going to be the culinary leaders going forward, what do you hear from your peers, from your fellow chefs, in terms of which cities are the best ones to open uh, a higher-end restaurant? Well, I think New York City is still the number one city for sure. I mean, there is, of course, you can always be a big fish in a small pound. But in New York City, I think we have the capability for welcoming tourists and business and entertainment and sports in than no other city can. And of course, there is the hype of Miami. There is the hype. But when it comes to fine dining and when it comes to all dining, I think New York City, including all neighborhood, it's amazing. And, um, you know, people are craving to come back to New York City. I see the double deck bus passing by the pavilion and because it's on the second floor. I see the double deck bus full of people. And I'm like, wow, is there some tourists back? And I hear mm -hmm. that concierge are calling us and telling us their hotel are reopening. So it's, it's, it's a good sign. I mean, right. Just a question of, for the uh, all the office building to be able to bring back their staff and certainly the unemployment to resume so we can bring people back to work. The romance, Danielle, of, of, of being at Grand Central Station and looking out that window to the Chrysler building, it speaks back to Le Pavillon of 1941, 1942 as well. Boy, have we well, changed how we eat now. What's your biggest challenge in developing repeat customers? What is the food angle, the menu angle that well, you need to do in 2021 to keep them coming in? Interestingly enough, yes, uh, vegetable is the rage. But uh, 24 <clears throat> years ago, when I opened Café Boulou in New York, I had already a vegetarian menu. And so this, I expanded more. And so Le Pavillon, the menu will be 50% seafood, 40% vegetable, and 10% of selected high quality meat. And so there is definitely a trend between, um, I wanted to have a certain uh, focus on the locality, so the mm -hmm. seafood is from New England for the most part, and also vegetable within the five state state around New York. And I think uh, this will be our focus there. But um, in general, people are craving for good food, good wine, and of course, healthy food. That's our yeah. responsibility. A colossal financial risk. Really, really interesting. Daniel Boulud, congratulations on launching Le Pavillon. And just really, really interesting to see in the coming months as uh, New York City uh, comes back. Thank you so much. Daniel Boulud, the acclaimed restauranteur. Uh, you know, I, I, we make jokes about it, Lisa, but the courage here, whether it's Daniel Boulud or it's somebody opening one of the many empty restaurants you and I see on the Upper uh, West Side and really throughout all of the city, there's just a certain courage to get it going. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you're seeing that courage implemented in a variety of places. Can I just say, Chef Balud's children have it better than mine. They had smoothies and uh, poached uh, eggs for breakfast. Yeah, I was you know, thinking, you know, it must be nice to have Chef Balud's children. Do you think he's ever taken an Eggo child. out of the refrigerator? I, I actually Eggo asked waffle. him, and he said no, but he said perhaps Belgian frozen waffles, which I've never heard of. Yeah. No, they eat better. I will say, uh, <laughs> you know, the key to success, vegetables, seafood. Oh. Not tang mimosas. Tang mimosas. Yeah, I'm just saying. Okay, you're just saying. I it has know. been an eventful day. We're <laughs> going to try to get to an eventful week. Uh, listen to us on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. We do this with a better tape. Green on the screen. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.